invite everyone to join the standing scene. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. tonight to the third chapter of the Living in Babylon tour. Adelaide and Brisbane last week, Melbourne later this week, but we are delighted to be with you here tonight in Perth. As you're here tonight, you probably sense that the Christian faith is facing new and unprecedented challenges. And while our faith has never been fashionable, I'm sure, like me, you are concerned by the hostility and contempt that is levelled at our faith. Not just at the institutions of the church, but increasingly towards our Saviour himself, which is why I'm so glad you're here tonight. Because tonight, Answers in Genesis founder, Ken Ham, is going to show you how to contend for the faith in modern times. And then Martin Isles 
will remind us that while it may feel like our faith is experiencing setbacks, the dominion of the Son of Man is everlasting and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give all of the attendees tonight peace in their hearts and a heart to listen and receive your word and the capacity to apply what they learn tonight. I pray that our speakers would be strengthened to bring the messages that you have put in their hearts and that you would be glorified tonight in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name. Many of you will know Martin Isles, preacher, lawyer and cultural commentator. Australian born, he is now the executive CEO of Answers in Genesis. Some of you may know that he's the author of a brand new book entitled, Who Am I? Solving the Identity Puzzle. It is a bestseller already, hard copies of which sold out on Amazon within one day. Dr. John MacArthur, an early reader in reviewing the book, says of Martin that he unfolds biblical truth with exquisite clarity and meticulous care. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you will have an opportunity to put your questions to Ken and Martin directly via Slido. And from time to time, you'll see that QR code on the screen. It'll certainly be there at the start of the Q&A, so prepare your questions in advance. We look forward to them. Please enjoy this short historical video, which will introduce Ken Ham. You know, I first started school teaching in Australia in 1975 as a public school teacher teaching science. I had already seen that the students were looking at Christianity as, well, not valid because of what was taught in their textbooks about evolution. I was challenging them concerning that. And as I took them to these museums, I was really burdened that, why can't we have a creation museum? Every museum we go to, it's always from an evolutionary perspective. So when we began the Ministry of Answers in Genesis, really the aim in mind was to build a creation museum. Hi, I'm Ken Ham. You know, God has something very special in store for this beautiful property. In the next few minutes, I want to share with you about an exciting project that's going to equip Christians, build them up in their faith, teach them to be able to have answers for the world and to be able to show that the Bible can be taken seriously and really is the Word of God. I see the creation ministry and what it's doing in the world today really akin to what Martin Luther did at the time of the Reformation. May 26th, 2007, the Creation Museum is officially open on the count of three, two, one. Imagine, imagine if we were to rebuild Noah's Ark, the size of the Ark, out of wood, to look like a real boat, the three floors so people could walk through and see exhibits where questions would be answered, such as how did Noah fit the animals on the Ark and how did he feed them and get rid of waste products and so on, answer questions about the flood and fossils, but most of all to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. did we come from? What was before the Big Bang? Uh, Bill, I, I just want to let you know that there, there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where matter came from. The very first sentence in that book says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I see God's hand in just so many miraculous ways. Unlikely people that he brought together in unusual ways in many instances. Unique circumstances, events, what we call Red Sea moments. But you know, with God, nothing is impossible. That's what his word says.
as many of you have experienced, Ken's resources have raised generations of Christians across the world and continue to do so. Ken and his wife, Mally, have five children, 18 grandchildren and a great-grandchild. His faithful ministry has spanned 50 years, but Ken has not been in Perth for over 30 years. So would you give a Perth welcome to one of Australia's favourite sons? Well, hi, everyone. Well, it's great to be back in Perth. Last time I was here, I had brown hair. I've had to dye it grey just to help people understand we do get older. Well, it's great to see all of you here. I believe what we're talking about is a very important topic. Uh, the ministry was started in our house actually in 1977 in Brisbane. It's called Answers in Genesis, and now it impacts conservatively. Our research would indicate directly 30 million people a year, indirectly tens of millions more. And we do all sorts of things through Answers in Genesis. We have curricula, we have all sorts of resources, books, and so on. We have our own uh, streaming platform, and we do a lot of outreach uh, as well internationally and uh, across America. And now we're kicking off, we're really revamping the Ministry of Answers and Genesis in Australia to have a much greater impact in this nation. And uh, we have a real burden to do that, Martin and I do, probably because we come from here uh, as part of it. Uh, we opened in America the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, and the Ark actually has become the biggest attraction in the state of Kentucky. It has a big impact on tourism in northern Kentucky, the Ark and the museum. And so we have a lot of different facilities there. Uh, we're building a, a new building right now to house one of the uh, biggest indoor models of Jerusalem in the world, probably the biggest actually. And we have a conference center, we have a carousel, we have virtual reality experience, uh, we have a zoo behind the ark, we have real animals in the zoo, as you can see, and we don't eat them. And. Uh, we have uh, a children's zoo we just opened. We have a wonderful playground for children. We do all sorts of conferences during the year, but we do daily programs for people who come to the Ark as well. And we have live animal programs in our zoo. And we do uh, live animal programs from a biblical worldview perspective. And then uh, the Ark itself, you can walk through all three decks, 130 exhibits, about uh, 8,000 cubic meters of wood. Uh, it's it's uh, 3.3 million board feet of timber and it's one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field and we do wonderful programs at Christmas, stunning lights and Christmas programs and the Creation Museum, which is my favourite place, that was our first attraction, is really a whole walk through the Bible and it has wonderful facilities as well, uh, playground that we have there, we have a zoo there as well and kids learn about that, well, and, and adults too, from a biblical worldview perspective. And we are building right now uh, the largest uh, glass conservatory in the state of Kentucky. There will be four glass greenhouses housing the plants of the Bible. And then we also have planetarium. We have a 4D theater. We have lots of exhibits, and we walk you through the whole Bible. We present the gospel very clearly. We do that at both places. That's the whole point of what we do. We have an insectarium, we have a dinosaur exhibit, and we have the most powerful pro-life exhibit in the world. Uh, there's just nothing else like it uh, there. And then we do wonderful uh, Christmas programs, stunning lights, and so on there uh, as well. So how many of you now want to come to Northern Kentucky to visit the Ark and the Creation Museum? And when you come from Australia, I'd encourage you to spend you know, minimum three days, but even up to a week, because there's so much to see, so much uh, to do there. And we have our own Christian school. Our eldest daughter actually founded that, Answers Academy. And uh, we, we were just able to obtain a building <laughs> uh, very inexpensively, but it used to be Toyota's national headquarters uh, there in America. And a third of it has been renovated for our school. We're moving our offices into the other section. We also have our own streaming platform, and we're going to share with you, uh, after I finish speaking tonight, how you can get a 12-month subscription to that totally free. 
Well, it's not totally free. You have to buy something to get it totally free, but it's totally free. So, I uh, also wanted to thank uh, Vision Christian Radio. If you don't tune into Vision Christian Radio, I encourage you to do that. We have a wonderful partnership with them. They interview myself and Martin uh, quite regularly, actually, and so we appreciate them. They have a booth here. I wanted to quickly mention to you uh, some of the impactful books that we have, Divided Nation. I spoke on this in Adelaide, and I encourage you to go back and watch the programs if we've already done, one in Adelaide, one in Brisbane. We're doing different presentations in each city that we're going to. So before in total for me and for, for, for Martin. Uh, this book really is all about what's happening to our culture, why has it become so secularized, why is much of the church so lukewarm and not impacting the culture, and why does it matter what you believe about God's word in Genesis? Because Genesis 1 to 11 is actually the foundation for everything. Did you know that? Everything ultimately is founded in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. And then I did this one, which is a commentary on Genesis 1 to 11 for the whole family, verse by verse through Genesis 1 to 11, answering all the most asked questions, because Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for all doctrine, for our worldview, for everything. And this is number one of a series of books called The Answers Books, and it has 25 of the most asked questions that people ask about God's Word, about Christianity today. And then there's a, a, a series that goes with that, but that's number one. And Martin just produced his brand new book dealing with a topic that is so important for our culture today, the identity issue. Who am I? And uh, how do I understand that? And uh, this is dealing with that issue in a very powerful way. Also, I wanted to say to you that tonight, um, courtesy of a man called Gary Kim from America and 316 Publishing, they sent over to give each one of you at these conferences uh, a Bible. Now, it's, it's the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, but it's got more than that, because I always wanted to see one of these, you know, a lot of people you hand out New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, but actually Genesis needs to be there because it's the foundation for everything in the New Testament. And it sets the foundation for the gospel, for all of our doctrines. So they produced a special Bible for us, and this is the new Legacy Standard Bible, which is an update of the New American Standard Translation, so it's a very literal translation, and we're thrilled to be able to promote it. But you're going to get one of these each at the end of the night, and it has Genesis and New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. And the reason, uh, the reason you have to wait till the end of the night is that we knew that hardly anyone would want to stay in here, Martin, and so to get you to stay, we're going to give you that free Bible. <laughs> All right, I know that's not true. And we are live streaming the conferences. If you haven't seen uh, the other two, I encourage you to do that because the one I did in Adelaide really sets the scene, the foundations of the importance of the book of Genesis in Brisbane. I talked about the issue of death and suffering and a loving God and how do you understand that. And tonight I'm going to deal more with an emphasis on apologetics uh, talking about how to defend the Christian faith. I'm sure you've all been, or most of you have been, to a commencement address, a graduation address uh, at a university. And I was over here with my wife a number of years ago, and we went to a graduation ceremony in uh, Queensland, and we had one of our uh, relatives, one of our family that was graduating. And they had this judge as a guest speaker. And so you can imagine the stage, all these academics on stage, and uh, they had their gowns on and so on. And they introduced this judge to give the commencement address. And there were thousands of people there, thousands of them. It was a massive place. And the judge got up and said, well, students, here you are, you're graduating. And then you're going to go out and live in this world. You're commencing the next phase of your life. And then eventually you'll die. And so I'm sure on your mind is the question that was on my mind when I was graduating, what are you going to do until you're dead? I turned to my wife and I said, this is going to be great. <laughs> I mean, what an encouraging talk already. And the judge said, I want to tell you that for me, there were three books that totally impacted my life that determine a lot of who I am and what I do until I'm dead. I want to tell you about those books, she said. The first one, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> I turned to my wife and said, I've got to get that one. <laughs> and she said, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course, you know, deep thought, the computer was searching for the meaning of life, and he found it. 
42. I remember turning to my wife, Mary, and I said, 42, can you imagine it? That's the meaning of life, 42. Wow, those students must be thrilled. And then she went on to the second book, and I missed it because I was still thinking about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and what it meant. <laughs> and I said, to, I said to Mally, I missed the second book. What am I going to do? But I didn't miss the third one. The second one, I sort of heard something about it, didn't even understand, something in the background, didn't understand what it was all about. And then she said, and the third book that's greatly impacted me was Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> I said to Mally, I've got to get that book. I did, and I started to read it. The mythos over Logos argument states that our rationality is shaped by these legends, and our knowledge today is in relation to the legends as a tree is in relation to the little shrub it once was. One can gain great insights into the complex overall. Anyway, I never did finish it, but... <laughs> and then she went on, and, and she gave the charge to the students. So, students, here's what I'm saying to you. You're going to find there are things that impacted you just like those three books impacted me. And you need to go out there and, and, and make sure that that impact is with you and until you're dead. And then she sat down. And I said to Mally, wow, if I was one of those students, I'd probably want to jump off a cliff right now and get it over and done with. <laughs> I mean, what a message of hopelessness and meaninglessness. But that's the message of the world. Do you realize that's the message of the public education system? Do you realize we have generations of people, of kids that are being taught, there's no God, everything came about by natural processes. You, you came about by natural processes over millions of years. Millions of years of death and struggle, death all around us. And when you die, that's the end of you. When you die, you're done. That's the message of the world. That's the message of the secular world. That's the message of the public education system. That's the message of the secular media. You know, and I sat there and thought, oh, I wish I could get up there and speak to all those students. Because you see, she mentioned those books, but there's one book that was missing that is the most important book of all. And it's the one the judge didn't talk about at all, and it's the Word of God. And this is the one book that the world needs. But you know, if I had got up and mentioned, ah, oh, here's a book, the Bible, I think a lot of those young people would have said, the Bible? Well, we know that's not true. A lot of people would even say, what is the Bible? Because these days, the Bible's either taught against or not mentioned, and a lot of people haven't even heard about it. We have younger generations today, they don't know what the Bible is. So they don't understand what sin is. They don't understand who God is. And for a lot of them, you know, I've traveled all around the world for the past 40-odd years. And one of the things I find, doesn't matter what country you go to, when they hear you on about Christianity or the Bible, they ask all these questions. Well, don't live in a scientific age. Well, hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible is true? What evidence is there for God? Well, who made God? You believe in Adam and Eve. Where did Cain get his wife? How did all the races come about if there are only two people to start with? Where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years in evolution? We know man evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? And didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolve into birds? And how could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? And hasn't science proved evolution is true? And isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Just for interest, put your hand up if you've heard those sorts of questions. Oh, wow, that's a shock. Well, no, it's not, because they're the sorts of questions people ask today. And by the way, that's just some of them, but they mostly relate to the history in the Bible. They're all an attack on the history that the history is not true. Christianity is based in history. If the history is not true, then how can Christianity be true? The gospel is based in history, and the history in Genesis 1 to 11. And you know, we're told in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense or give an answer. And the word defense or answer comes from the Greek word apologia, from which we get our word apologetics, which means to give a logical reason defense of the faith. And so I want to challenge each one of us tonight. Don't, don't put your hands up, just sit there and think about this. How many of us could answer those sorts of questions? Because these are the sorts of questions people ask today. You know the sad thing I found? Most of our churches do not raise up generations in the church to know how to answer those questions. Most do not teach apologetics. You know what happens in most of our churches? We teach Bible stories. You know what I mean by Bible stories? Jonah and the Great Fish, Feeding of 5,000, Paul's Missionary Journey. Don't get me wrong, we want to teach those as true, but even the word story today has come to mean fairy tale. There are atheists that say, oh, they, you learn stories at church, you learn real stuff at school. 
We've even got to stop using the word story. There's an incredible attack today on the Bible's history. And you know, because most of our church leaders, most of our pastors, not all, but the majority, and the majority of our Christian academics have said Genesis is not important, doesn't matter, you can believe in evolution, you can reinterpret it, don't worry, trust in Jesus. And we wonder why so many walk away from the faith when they realize if you can't trust the history in the Bible and you can't trust the history in Genesis, how can you trust the rest? And I want to go through and just give you a few examples tonight of how to defend the Christian faith when people ask you questions. Because this is what we should be doing, raising up our kids this way. We need to be raising up our, our Sunday school kids, the people in, in our Bible studies, the people in our churches. We need to be raising them up equipped so they can defend the Christian faith. And the reason? So they, can, they point people to God's word and the saving gospel. We're not trying to prove the Bible. We're just showing that we can give an answer. Because so many times, non-Christians think we can't answer the questions. And they think, see, these Christians, you know, it's just a blind faith. And so I'm going to go through and, you know, you can talk a lot more about each of these questions, but I'm just going to do a few real quickly. For instance, does science confirm an infinite God? Notice I don't say prove, I say confirm. Because you can't ultimately prove anything uh, because we are finite beings, only God can. The very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Do you realize if that verse is not true, neither is the rest of the Bible? Do you realize the whole rest of the Bible depends on that verse being true? And we could talk about lots of things. We could talk about the laws of nature. Where'd they come from? How come there are laws? I mean, if everything evolved by chance, random processes, why do we trust those laws? Couldn't they evolve more tomorrow? How can you believe in, in those laws? And those laws are immaterial. If you're an atheist and you believe everything is material, where did the immaterial laws come from? Laws of nature. How do you explain that? What about the laws of logic? You know, I had a young man once and he was at a conference. He said, oh, Mr. Ham, I heard you. Your seminar, but I still believe we all evolve by chance, random processes. And I said, oh, you do? Yes, sir. I said, so if you evolve by chance, random processes, your brain evolved by chance, random processes, right? Well, yes, sir. And I said, if your brain evolved by chance, random processes, your processes of logic evolved by chance, random processes. Yes, sir. I said, if your processes of logic evolved by chance, random processes, you don't even know they evolved the right way. I said, son, you don't even know you're asking the right question. And he looked at me and he said, what was the name of that book you recommended? Because <laughs> he got the point. But I want to give this example. DNA, that molecule of heredity that makes up our chromosomes, our genes, all the information that builds us, or a cat, or an elephant, or a dog. You know, DNA was first discovered as a, that helical structure by two British scientists, Francis Crick and James Watson, back in 1953. <laughs> you know, hey, for the men in this room, I don't know about you, I have trouble remembering birthdays. My wife knows the birthday of every one of our grandkids, all our kids. She even knows mine. And she remembers all those things. And I think, how on earth does she remember all that stuff? And, but I have learned. When I'm thinking about, you know, for instance, in America, when I hear it's Pearl Harbor Day, 7th of December. 7th of December. That's my wife's birthday is on Pearl Harbor Day. That's how I remember it. And then... <laughs> Now, how old is she? When did Watson and Crick discover the helical structure of DNA? That was in 1950, and then I figure it out. So that's how I do it. <laughs> I've been over to a museum in London where you can see the actual first model of DNA that Watson and Crick actually built. You know, it was interesting. Back in 2003, on the 50th anniversary of the discovery of that molecule, Crick, now obviously they've both passed on now, he was 86 then. He said, the God hypothesis is rather discredited. Indeed, he says his distaste for religion was one of the prime motives in the work that led to the sensational 1953 discovery. In other words, Watson and Crick both said uh, they were atheists, and they said the reason they really did this research was to show the world there's no God. And you know what they said? We found that life is built on a molecule. It's just chemistry. There's no God. There you are. But you know, we've done a lot of research on DNA. And it's not just chemistry. In fact, I have a piece of rope there with red and blue beads on the rope, and those red and blue beads spell out the word help. You all know that, right? If you know the Morse code, they spell out the word help. If you don't know the Morse code, they're red and blue beads on a rope. <laughs> now, if you had a long enough piece of rope and a lot of beads, you could write the entire Bible. But you've got to know the language. You've got to know the code. 
And you know, DNA, we found, is basically an information system read by a, a code, a language system. And actually, DNA makes the language system to read the DNA. Wow. When I was at university, I had a professor who said, I can show you there's no God. Let's put the letters of the alphabet in a hat. I, I should have asked him where the letters came from, but we didn't do that. <laughs> and then he passed it around the class and said, pull out some letters, and three students pulled out B-A-T, bat. Look, we got a word. Given enough time, we could get more words. Given enough time, even as remote as it seems, you must admit there's always the probability that we could get words in a sentence and eventually get the encyclopedia. There's no God. That's what happened. DNA, by chance, molecules came together. Bingo, there we have it. No God. You know what I should have asked? Who was, that word, who was that word a word to? Was it a word to a Dutchman, a Frenchman, a Chinese? Who was it a word? It's only a word to somebody who already has the language. See, those beads are only a word to somebody who knows the Morse code. Otherwise, they're not a word. And you know what is interesting? When you look at DNA, we found out that it has an incredible amount of information that's read by a language system, and DNA makes the language system. Uh, a German scientist, Dr. Werner Gitt, who's an information scientist, and in his book, the in the beginning was information, he said, there is no natural law through which matter can give rise to information. In other words, matter can't give rise to information. Information has to come from information, from an intelligence. There's zillions of bits of information in living things. Where, where did it come from? Matter can't produce it by itself. There is no natural law that shows that. And a code system is always a result of a mental process. Codes only come from intelligence. If you don't put intelligence into your computer code, you know what happens. It's got to have intelligence. Do you know what DNA cries out? In the beginning, God created. And you know what the Bible says? If you don't believe in God, you are without excuse for his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the world in the things that have been made. You don't believe in God, you are without excuse. It's so obvious there's a God. You know, have you ever watched those TV programs, documentary programs, and somebody, a scientist, an archaeologist, goes into a cave and they find an arrowhead, like an Indian arrowhead. And they get all excited. We found an arrowhead. Somebody carved this stone. Wow. And they come out, and it's almost like they're holding it in their hand as a religious relic. And, and they're coming out, and they're holding it there. Look at this. There's intelligence. People lived in this cave. We can see the evidence. And then the same scientists look at the most complex information language system in the entire universe, and they say, chance, chance, chance. And they look at an arrowhead. Intelligence. There is something wrong because they don't want to believe. You know, I often get children. I, I remember one conference, I had a little boy come up to me. He was about 10 years old. And he said, well, Mr. Ham, then who made God? Hmm, how do you answer questions like that? We, we need to be teaching our children these things, answers to these questions. And I said to him, well, son, if somebody made God, you'd have to have a bigger God, right? Yes, sir. I said, now you've got a problem. Yes, sir. Well... Where'd the bigger God come from? You'd have to have a bigger, bigger God who made the bigger God who made God, right? But yes, sir. I said, now you've got a problem. I know. <laughs> who made the bigger God? Bigger God. You'd have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God. Yes, sir. But now you've got a problem. I know. <laughs> who made the bigger, bigger, bigger God? You have to have a bigger, 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 bigger God who made the bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God. I said, do you realize, young man, you go back, and you go back, and you keep going back, and you've got to get to the biggest God of all, which is the God of the Bible, the God who exists in eternity, the God who wasn't created, because he is the creator. That's the only thing that logically, obviously, makes sense. And you know something? The biggest God of all is the infinite God of creator. In the beginning, God, it doesn't set out to prove God. God is, God is there, he's the Alpha and Omega. He's always been there. But I want you to understand something else. We're finite beings. Therefore, we've got to understand there is a faith aspect to this. And I often find it's the atheists who say, you Christians have blind faith. No, it's the atheists that have to have blind faith. 
We have an objective faith, a faith that makes sense of the, of the laws of nature, a faith that makes sense of DNA. It's an objective faith. It is not a blind faith. It's a faith we can confirm from scientific investigation. Not only do the atheists have a blind faith, their faith lacks credulity because it's not logical. It does not make sense. When I was debating Bill Nye, and you saw a little clip there before, and uh, he was asked the question, where did matter come from? He said, I don't know, it's a great mystery. So why is there matter? Why is there anything? Why is there energy? Where did it all come from? Well, he would rather believe in eternal matter or eternal energy, but not an eternal God. It doesn't make sense. Hebrews 11 reminds us, without faith it is impossible to please him, for those who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he is rewarder of those who seek him. So understand something. When we're accused of having faith, we say, of course we have faith. We're finite beings. But it's not a faith that's a blind faith. This is a faith that makes sense of what we see. And not only that, I go on to say to them, and this book claims to be the word of God over 3,000 times. And as I take what God says about creation, about the entrance of sin and death, about the flood of Noah's day, about the Tower of Abel, and we can go on to prophecies and prophecies concerning Christ and, and the babe in a manger and so on, it makes sense of what we see. And science overwhelmingly confirms it. And we have to ask a question then, why do people reject God? Well, I want you to hear what Bill Nye said. I, debated him for two hours as we walked through the ark after it opened and I challenged him all the way through but this is just one little part of that two-hour debate. So let me ask a question. How do you determine what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, on what basis, like if these young people over here want to know what's right and what's wrong, how do you determine that? Two ways. Mm -hmm. First of all, based on what I feel mm -hmm. as a member of the human tribe. So feeling, so sub they're subjective. Absolutely. So your what feelings. We call subjective. Okay, but your we feelings. Call a result of uh, altruism. So your fi your feel. feelings could be different to somebody else's feelings. So the second thing. Is Correct. Your feelings could be different absolutely. to somebody else. The so somebody could have a different morality to you. Different morality. I'm open-minded, but a little skeptical. A different view of a specific event. Okay. So if somebody said to you, "I think types like you are dangerous. I want to get rid of you," would you say that's right or wrong? It depends. Okay. Okay? And here's right. the second thing. Mm -hmm. You remember I mentioned there were two things. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we establish laws by consensus. By consensus. So Our different... tribe gets together okay. and decides what's right and wrong. Okay. We so know that we, discuss, we, dis, we agree on degrees of rightness and wrongness. Okay. A parking so, ticket, not as serious as running somebody over with your car. So there could be a different consensus by a different group. Absolutely, and this process is what we call... You just said absolutely, but that's an absolute. Very much. You said an absolute. Very much. We determine this by our legal system. And tribes all over the world have legal systems and legal traditions. By the way, at least he's being consistent. If you don't have an absolute authority, right and wrong is whatever you want to make it, and somebody else can have a different right and wrong, and somebody else can have a different good and evil and bad, and however you want to define it. People, do you realize we've got generations brought up in this nation who have been told there's no God, morality is subjective, and we wonder why we've got all sorts of worldview issues and issues in regard to gender and marriage and all sorts of other things because they don't have the foundation and the absolute authority of the Word of God. And you see, this is what's happening in our culture. There are two worldviews ultimately because there are two foundations for those worldviews. Basically, you could say God and no God. God's word, man's word. On the basis of man's word, they build a worldview that means basically anything goes. You determine right and wrong. Why not gay marriage? I've got marriage in quotes because there's only one marriage. It's the one God created, and he created a man and a woman, and that was marriage. Because God defines marriage, not us. But you get rid of God, you'd redefine everything the way you want. Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. You're just an animal. What's developing in your womb is an animal. So abortion at any stage, you're just getting rid of an animal. What does it matter? And so it goes on. But you start from God's word, which begins in Genesis 1 to 11, which is the foundation for the rest of the Bible, for our worldview, and for everything. We know that there's only one marriage because God created marriage. He created marriage in Genesis 2, 24. He, when he made Eve from Adam's side, and you become one because you're one flesh. He quotes that in Matthew 19 in the New Testament. We know that life begins at fertilization and humans are made in the image of God, different to the animals. Abortion is killing a human being right from fertilization. And how do we know that's wrong? 
There's only one way we know that's wrong is because God is the creator and he says murder is wrong. You see, we've got to understand something. Even a lot of the pro-life movement in America, they, they're not on about the Bible. They're on about, well, we can't kill a human being. But you know what? There are people out there who say, so what? It's a human being. We're just animals. There's no God. When you die, that's the end of you anyway. The only reason ultimately to be against abortion is because we believe God's word and because we're Christians. And you know, what has happened in our culture is that the secular world has uh, plummeted plummeled Genesis 1 to 11 in particular in our time have said that history is not true they've attacked God's word many in our churches and many of our leaders have said don't worry about Genesis 1 to 11 and then we have people in our churches Christians saying how do we deal with all these issues because you see you can't just fight the issues that that conflict at a worldview level is because there's a conflict foundationally between God's word and man's word and so what our ministry is all about and the books that we have and so on is to help raise up generations with the right foundation beginning in Genesis 1 to 11 with the right worldview who know what they believe and why who are equipped with answers to defend the Christian faith who understand the real battle is a foundational battle because it's only then that you can begin to deal with those issues and sadly most of our churches are not teaching that and we wonder why the church is so lukewarm we wonder why people are frightened to go and witness to people because they don't know how to answer the questions you know in 1975 when I became a teacher in Queensland in Dolby one of the of the first science lesson I had one of the students asked me how could Noel get the animals on the ark and one of the things I have found over the years is that that's been one of the big questions that atheists have come with Noah's Ark can't be true the flood can't be true you can't fit the millions of species of animals on the ark when I debated Bill Nye at the creation museum in 2014 he said with all the world's media watching millions of people were live streaming actually he said uh, Noah's Ark can't be true because he couldn't fit all the millions of species on the ark but God's word doesn't say species went on the ark and see just a little bit of basic high school genetics you know the Bible says God created kinds according to their kind the implication is each kind produces its own kind. This will be radical for you, but it means elephants produce elephants. <laughs> it means dogs produce dogs. Pretty radical stuff. And then the Bible tells us two of each kind, seven pairs of some went on the ark, and it was only of the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals, not all the creatures on earth. And we need to understand what the word kind means. It comes from the Hebrew word mean, and when you look at our classification system, kingdom, farm, class, order, family, genus, species, we would say from our research that in most instances, kind is at the family level of classification. Not species, mainly family. And when you come to the ark, notice I didn't say if, when you come to the ark, you'll see on deck one, a model of Noah's ark, and it says 1,398 animal kinds at the most on Noah's ark. We think the real number is less than 1,000. We've overestimated for certain reasons. And then we have a list of the various kinds. How did our scientists decide what the kinds were? Well, take dogs. There are 34 species of dogs, and we can show they're all interconnected by genetics. In other words, this species bred with that one, that one 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 never bred with that one, but they're still connected. When they're all connected like that, we'd say they're all the one kind, and dogs are connected at the family level. And when you look at those species of dogs that we have today, that's just some of them, we would also say... They didn't exist originally, and they didn't exist before the flood. Now, I'll explain that very quickly in a moment. We find all cats are connected at the family level. Now, when God made the dog kind, the cat kind, the human kind, he put all this information in our DNA. Remember, information can't come by chance. It's created information. And so there's all this information that allows an incredible amount of, of, uh, uh, of variation. And so only two dogs were needed on the ark, they came off the ark and then they started to increase in number and now because of the flood, well you hear this, because of the flood there was climate change. <laughs> and there's been ever since climate change and there will continue to be climate change. And if you don't believe the flood and don't believe God's word, you'll get it all wrong about climate change. <laughs> and so as a 
increase in number, some go over here, some go there, some go there. Uh, it, over here in, in cold environment, those that have variations for shorter, for longer hair survive better. Those over in the hotter environments, longer hair, uh, shorter hair survive better. And over time you get your species of dogs and they're still dogs and that's not evolution, that's just dogs. And so you know that uh, we have a convention where letters represent genes, dominant, recessive, much more complicated than this, but this is basic high school genetics to explain it. Sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the male, one from the female. Then you get all these different combinations here that are different to each other. Um, I usually use this one to represent a poodle because it's got a lack of information, uh, as you can see. No longer has the big A's, big B's, or big C's. And so, if you breed poodles with poodles, you're not going to get back to the original dogs, right? You, you've, uh, it's not going to happen. But could you start with the original dogs and again get poodles? Theoretically, yes. Uh, so, over time, what happens? You imagine two dogs get off Noah's Ark, they have an S gene for short hair, long gene, uh, L gene for long hair, they have different offspring with different combinations, and you know what's taught in the public schools? Oh, look, something new, it's got long hair, this is new, that's evolution. Look inside. What's new? The combination of information, but not the information, it was already there, and it's actually got less information than the parents. And so, what's called natural selection adaptation leading to speciation sort of goes like this. They move to a cold climate. In a cold climate, those that have short hair and medium hair variations get cold and die. <laughs> and so now, you're only left with dogs with L genes. Oh, it's evolution. That's the opposite of evolution. Those that go to a hot climate, those with medium hair and long hair overheat and die. And now you're left with those with S genes, so over time you end up with these different species of dogs, which is not evolution. And people, students in schools aren't being taught this. I taught it when I was teaching at Dolby High School and the other teachers got angry at me because I taught the children how to think. And then when they challenged the other teachers, they didn't have the answers. And you know, just to help us understand, that's a number of atoms in the universe, estimated atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th power. That number's so big you can't comprehend it. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, do you know how many children you could have without having two with the same combination of information just from your genes right now? It's that number. See, God put that sort of information in the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. You can understand, two of each kind, seven pairs of some, come off the ark, you get all these different species. Population growth is exponential, doesn't take very long. It's easy to explain. If only we were giving them these answers. What a difference it would make. You, 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 mean, you, you mean the Bible's account? We could, we could actually believe that. Of course, because it's God's word. The science confirm a young universe and earth. Oh, there's an emotional one for you. It's emotional in the church. I think the dividing line in many ways with a lot of Christians in the churches is this issue of the age of the earth. Secular scientists believe the earth is 5 billion years old and the universe is 15 billion years old. But you start from God's word, it says God made everything in six days. Are those days ordinary days? Yes. <laughs> but the word day, the Hebrew word yom, can mean things other than ordinary day. Of course it can. That's not the point. The point is when does it mean an ordinary day? And you know when the word yom is qualified with a number or evening and morning? or you have the word evening or morning with the word day on their own, or the word night, it always means an ordinary day. That You have a look up any Hebrew dictionary, it'll tell you. Genesis 2.4 says in the day that the Lord created, there's no evening, morning, number, night. It means time there, like in the day of the Lord, in the time of the judges. But in uh, Genesis 1 for the six days, notice something. You start to look at it for day one. Evening, morning, number, night, day two. Evening, morning, number, evening, morning, number, evening, morning. It's almost like... God is saying something to us. <laughs> like, these people in the 21st century are going to be so thick that I'm not just going to use a number, I'm going to use evening, morning, and number, and they're still not going to get it because you know what? They don't want to believe my word. And you know, in Exodus 20, the basis of the fourth commandment, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, verse 1, and the sea and everything else, the rest of Genesis 1, in six days, there's no room for a gap of millions of years. There's no room for millions of years anyway. And that's the basis of our seven-day week. If those days are ordinary days, we learn that God made Adam on day six, 
And then we go through those genealogies, which are very tight. There, in Genesis 5, Adam had a son, Seth, at 130, he fathered Enosh at 105, he fathered Kenan at 90, he fathered Mahalal at 70, he fathered Jared at 65, he fathered Enoch at 162, he fathered Methuselah at 65, he fathered Lamech at 187, he fathered Noah at 182, and then at 500, Noah fathered Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and then you come to the time of Abraham, and then up to the babe in the manger, and up to the present, and that's where the 6,000 years comes from. So... If anyone says to me, why do you believe in a, in a young earth? Because I take God at his word. He created everything in six days. Those genealogies are clear. We don't get millions of years. And so we only believe in thousands of years. And then people say, what about all those dating methods? You know, there are hundreds of physical processes that actually set limits on the age of the earth. But 90% of them or more contradict the billions of years. We're only told about the 10% that seem to agree. And even on the 10%, there's all sorts of problems because they're all based on fallible assumptions. Uh, Dr. Andrew Snelling, uh, a, a creation scientist, works with us, uh, did research on the crinum mine in Queensland, and there was a basalt flow that overflowed trees. Trees were in the basalt when they drilled down and when they, and when they dated the basalt by potassium argon dating, it dated to 45 million years old. When they dated the wood by carbon dating, it was 45,000 years old. There's a slight problem there. <laughs> when Mount St. Helens in America, the state of Washington, erupted in 1980, it formed a lava dome and in 1994, a scientist uh, took samples of the lava dome and using potassium argon dating, when he used the whole rock, it dated to 0.35 million years. Uh, when he used amphibole, it was 0.9 million years. When he used pyroxene concentrate, it was 2.8 million years. But the dome was just a few years old. People, there's something wrong with those dating methods. They're all based on assumptions. There's only one dating method you can trust absolutely. It's the Word of God. And we need to judge man's methods by God's Word, not the other way around. It's about time we started doing that in the church. You know, in 1942, and we have this exhibit in the Ark Encounter, actually, there were six P-38 fighters and two B-17 bombers who were landed on the ice in Greenland. They ran out of fuel. Years later, they went back to look for them. 46 years later, they couldn't find them at first. They eventually found them three miles from the original location, and uh, they were buried 250 feet deep in the ice. And they were able to actually melt the ice down there and be actually take one of those planes out. How many times have we told all these ice cores form over millions of years? And there's lots of other methods. We could look at comets. Comets shouldn't exist if the universe is billions of years old. But comets exist. Why? Well, the evolutionists say because there's a cloud called the Oort cloud that gives rise to the comets. Has anyone seen it? No. How do you know it's there? Because we've got comets and the universe is billions of years old. I mean, that's the logic. It really is. And spiral galaxies, spiral ga there's millions, trillions of spiral galaxies. And they rotate differentially because the inner parts rotate faster than the outer parts. Those spirals shouldn't even exist. And then we ask another question, which is very important. Can Christians believe in millions of years? Now, don't get me wrong. There are many Christians who believe in millions of years. I'm not saying you're not a Christian if you believe in millions of years. If you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, you're truly born again. You've trusted Christ for salvation and you believe in millions of years, then I would say, you, I, I wouldn't say you're not a Christian, I would say, but you're being inconsistent. And actually I would challenge you that you're undermining the authority of the word of God. Because you see, the idea of millions of years came out of atheism of the 1800s that the fossil record was laid down millions of years before man. Now I want you to think about that in regard to death, because the fossil record is full of death. Think about the origin of death, first of all. The Bible says God made everything very good, but Adam, if you eat of that one tree, you'll surely die. Adam ate of that tree. There's the origin of sin. By the way, the origin of sin is in Genesis. The origin of death is in Genesis. You want to talk about why Jesus died, what death has to do with salvation? You want to talk about why we're a sinner? You have to start with Genesis. It's the foundation for the gospel. The first promise of the Savior is in Genesis 3.15, which is really the whole message of the Bible in one verse. The promise of the babe in a manger who stepped into history 2,000 years ago. We date our calendars from that event. 
And the Bible says because a man sinned, the first death was when God made garments of, clo- garments of skins and clothed them. The origin of clothing comes from Genesis. First blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was pointing to the one who would be our saviour. At the Creation Museum, we have the sacrifice scene, the first sacrifice. And Adam and Eve, wearing those clothes, it set up the sacrificial system because uh, sa- animals were going to be sacrificed over and over and over again, but that doesn't take away our sin because we're not an animal. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Because death was a penalty for sin, there had to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin. But it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin because we're not an animal. We're made in the image of God. Again, that, that impacts the abortion issue. It's important to understand that. Do you know what we're taught in the public schools and universities? We're just an animal. We're related to the animals. No, we're not. We're related to each other, which is why there's only one race in the world, not different races, because we all come from Adam and Eve, which means when you get married, you marry your relative. (laughs) True. Which helps you understand that originally, sons and daughters married, but they didn't have all the genetic problems because of sin and the curse that we have today. No, you realize a man brought sin and death into the world. A man would have to pay the penalty for sin. We're all sinners. We can't pay the penalty. God, from eternity, had a plan to step into history in the person of his son to become the perfect man, but the God-man, the babe in a manger, to suffer the penalty of death, the consequence of our sin, but conquer death, be raised from the dead. He conquered the devil and offers a free gift of salvation if you will receive it. Wow. The gospel. It's what it's all about. But see, if you believe in millions of years as a Christian, you believe all those layers of fossils were laid down over millions of years before man, there's evidence of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs, but the Bible says originally Adam and Eve and the animals were vegetarian. It wasn't until Genesis 9, after the flood, God said, just as it gave you the plants, now you can eat everything, is what he said to us. That's when he changed our diet. If you believe in millions of years, there's all sorts of... Uh, diseases in the fossil record like cancer, abscesses and so on wait a minute did all that exist before sin there's also thorns in the fossil record said to be millions of years old the Bible says thorns came after the curse how could God call cancer very good there's lots of documented evidence of cancer in the bones in the fossil record these two things can't be true at the same time if you believe in millions of years you're blaming God for death God's not responsible our sin is responsible we sinned against the Holy God. We don't even deserve to, deserve to exist. Those two are totally contradictory. Which means, if what I'm saying about the Bible is right, all those fossil layers couldn't have been laid down over millions of years. How would you understand fossils? Well, if you believe the history in Genesis, there was a global flood, and you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You know what you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And then we could go on. Does science confirm one human race? Because you realize if the Bible's history is true, this is the history, that we all go back to Adam and Eve. They had sons and daughters. And that by the time of the flood, a lot of people, then eight people got on that ship. They came off the ship, gave rise to more people, rebelled against God again, gave different languages. They formed the different people groups or cultures around the world. But it means we're all one race. Do you know what happened in the year 2000? The Human Genome Project, headed by an atheist, where they obtained DNA from humans all around the world, in different people groups, and they sequenced the human genome, and this is what they announced to the world. It was in newspapers all over the world. They put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome, unanimously declared, there's only one race, the human race. Wow, who would have thought of that? (laughs) Do you know what the church should have done? Do you know what church leaders should have done? Told you, been telling you that all along. But do you know why most of the church didn't do that? Because they hadn't been taught Genesis. Most people don't know what to believe. They're not sure what to believe. They're not game to get up and say these things because many of our leaders have taught against Genesis and they don't know. People, you believe God's word. You've got those answers. And you know what? Science confirms it over and over. Hey, what does the Bible say? Eight people got off that ship. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark... And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. The Bible makes it clear. All people today go back to the three sons of Noah. 
And because of an event called the Tower of Babel, it formed different people groups, not races. We're all the, the, the same race. We shouldn't talk about races. You know, people often say to me, well, how come there's different colors of people if we go back to Adam and Eve? Actually, there aren't any different colors. We're all the same color, basically. The main pigment in our skin is melanin. It's a brown pigment. You know, and people say to me, well, wait a minute. There's white people and there's black people. And they look at me and say, you're a white person. Let me tell you, I am not a white person. I can prove it to you. I am not a white person. I'll prove it to you in less than a second. I am not a white person. <laughs> We're actually all brown. And when you go out in the sun, sunlight stimulates production of melanin to the maximum your genes have already predetermined, actually. Do you realize from Adam and Eve with a mixture of genes, you could get dark skin to light skin in one generation? There's many examples of that in the world. I want to give you one from Australia. There it is, right there. There's many examples of that. Hey, do you know what I'm saying to you? Do you realize whether it's in biology, anthropology, geology, biochemistry, when you use what we call observational science, using your five senses in the present, you can observe, repeat your experiments, different to historical science, which is beliefs about the past, observational science confirms God's word. And at the Creation Museum, a premier exhibit is the walk through the Bible we call the seven seas of history. A walk through creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. That's Genesis 1 to 11, and then Christ's cross consummation. And Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for all doctrine. It's the foundation for our worldview. It's the foundation for the rest of the Bible. It's the foundation for everything. There's nothing that ultimately is not founded in Genesis 1 to 11, and most of our churches haven't taught us that. And most of our leaders have said it doesn't matter. It's the foundation for the gospel. It's the foundation for marriage. It's the foundation for gender. The Bible says God made male and female. There's no other options. Are we going to believe God's word or not? But you see, we haven't been taught to in many instances. And you know, some people also say, well, apologetics. But apologetics, I mean, aren't you trying to prove the Bible? No. We're defending the Christian faith. We're giving answers. The Bible is true. It's God's word. It says it's God's word. I like the analogy of Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus. He came to the tomb of Lazarus and he said, take away the stone. He could have moved that stone with one word, with a thought. You do what you can do. You move the stone away. And then he did something they couldn't do. Lazarus come forth and he raised the dead. And people... What we're saying to you is this is what we should be doing as Christians. We've got to do the best we can to roll that stone away, to give answers, to defend our faith, to show we can defend the faith, to show how illogical it is to, to reject God, to show how the Bible makes sense of the world, and we're pointing to the Word of God the whole time and the Gospel and stand back and understand it's God who saves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And... You can only do this if you really start from the first 11 chapters and understand what you believe and why and equipped to defend the Christian faith because Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for marriage. Do you realize every single biblical doctrine of theology directly or indirectly is founded in Genesis 1 to 11? Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is, there, why is there sin? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is Jesus called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion over the creation and not the other way around as the climate change religion has it today? Genesis 1 to 11. You think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? And you know, once you believe that history, think about how it all comes together. God created everything. He made the first man and woman. He gave them a test. Adam took the fruit. He rebelled against God, the origin of sin. And as a consequence, death came into the world. Uh, God promised a savior that uh, this savior would come and would uh, uh, bruise the head. He would bruise his heel. He would be wounded in the process, which he was on the cross, but he was raised from the dead, but the devil was conquered. And then there was a flood of Noah's day. That's why we have fossils all over the earth. It's a picture of Jesus here, one door on the side of the ark. Noah and his family had to go through a door to be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. Any man who enters by me shall be saved. It's a picture of salvation, a warning that God judges wickedness, but he provides salvation. A warning here, God judges man's sin, but he promised a savior. Look at that. He's a gracious, loving God. Then the Tower of Babel, that's why we have different people groups, not races. There's your answer to racism right there. We're all one family. 
He promised a Savior back in Genesis 2,000 years ago. That Savior came. He died on a cross, raised from the dead. And he said one day he's going to come back again. He hasn't come back yet, but it will happen in the future. And for those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, when they die, not like what that judge said, when you die, that's it, that's the end of you. No, when you die, you're going to live for eternity, either with God or without God. And the reason we're doing what we do is because we want every one of you to be in heaven with us. And one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus is going to return and be restored to what it once was. I pray that every one of you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and can say that you know you're going to spend eternity with him. Hey, I'll end off with these two verses. In Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with the eternal gospel. Who's the gospel for? The gospel, the good news that Jesus died on a cross for our sin. He was raised from the dead. Who's that for? It's for every nation, tribe, language, and people because we're all one race. And one day, we're going to stand, for those who are Christians, we're going to stand in white robes before the Lord and there will be people from every nation, tribe, language standing before the throne because God saves people out of every group because we're all sinners, because we're all in need of salvation. Wow. People, that's what the Bible is all about. That's the most important message in the entire universe. And you know what? We want everyone to understand that message. And so tonight, after Martin speaks, and we're going to have a question time. It'll be a short question time. Uh, and then, uh, as you leave, we want to give you a copy of the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs, including Genesis. Go home and read Genesis again. And see, Genesis 1 to 11, it is the foundation for everything. Now, one of the most important parts of our ministry is to equip you. You won't remember what we say. I don't even remember what I say. And a lot of people say, how do I get these answers? How do I teach my children? How do I get equipped? And most of these materials are just not readily available. And so we have made us what I call the cream of the crop uh, of our materials for these conferences available to you at extra special prices with an extra special deal. Now, this is a virtual bookstore. The cost of shipping with petrol over here is like $10 million to get anything to Perth. Uh, and I uh, can't believe how much you people pay for petrol. It's outrageous. But anyway, most of that's tax, by the way, which is funding the public education. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> so you need to put some of your money into eternal investments, right? And these are. They have uh, eternal consequences. Uh, and so... Uh, we have a virtual book. So now, we did have samples of the books and the packs and everything to bring to you, to show you tonight. We, in fact, we had eight pallets of material that was going to be airlifted by Qantas over to Perth. It was airlifted from Adelaide uh, to Brisbane for the conference there. And Qantas, at the last minute, didn't tell us, rejected the shipment. I don't know why they rejected the shipment. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's got anything to do with the most woke airline in the world, but <laughs> no, I don't know. I, but they reject, they didn't even tell us. They couldn't care less, actually. Um, but we can't show you the samples, but anyway, let me go through these for you. Uh, these are the books I mentioned at the beginning, Divided Nation, what's really happening to our culture, why, uh, the, and what we can do about it, Genesis Foundation for Everything, Creation to Babel, uh, Commentary, Genesis 1 to 11, verse by verse. That's for the whole family. And Martin's new book, Who Am I? Dealing with Identity. Brand new book just came out, and it has been selling like uh, hotcakes. And then Answers Book 1, uh, the, the first 25 of the most asked questions. And uh, we sell you that at a special price, as you can see. And uh, that special price uh, there. And then what I'd encourage you, this is the best deal for you. We've added to it, we call this the Family Power Pack. We've added the new book, the latest book I did, on Divine Dilemma, which is dealing with the death and suffering issue. Spoke on that in Brisbane, but this is much more detailed. Uh, and really goes through the death of a younger brother of mine and how my mother coped with that and our family. Has answers to the whole death and suffering issue many other books don't have. And then Will They Stand is all about the family. And I'm going to speak on that in Melbourne, so watch the live stream for that. The family is the most first and most fundamental of all human institutions God ordained in Scripture. And there's an incredible attack on the family today because it's the educational unit of the nation. It's the unit God uses to transfer that spiritual legacy from one generation to the next. I challenge people what the Bible says about bringing up godly offspring, about the roles of parents, man and woman. And then we've got these for, for kids. Who, 
Yeah, fancy having to make these available today, but we have to. You know, why does God make me a boy? Why does God make me a girl? This one's an evangelism. You can't just go out today and say, you sinner, repent of your sin. People don't even know what sin is. Many don't even know what the Bible is. People, when Paul went to the pagan Greeks in Acts 17, he had to start at the beginning so they understood the gospel. And I'm challenging us that that's a method of evangelism to use. We discount that highly for you. Uh, and when you order it, we're gonna, we will ship it in the next uh, week or so. But if you buy either of the packs, we will give you a free 12-month subscription to our streaming platform, Answers TV, that has 6,000 programs right now. We keep adding more programs every day. And instead of watching pagan Netflix and these other pagan streaming platforms, we need quality, family-friendly material for our kids. And actually, the, power, the family pack, the big pack, $150, when you look at the discount, plus getting Answers TV for 12 months for free, that's a little value of $300 for you, and we will ship it out free. Look on this like Amazon. I'm going to Amazon, Christian Amazon. It's called Answers in Genesis. And I order these materials out there, and then we will ship them to you, free shipping, to get them to your homes. I mean, that is a deal. And you won't get them in these prices in the future. We also have a card on your seats where you can just fill that out, go out there, hand it in, tap your credit card, etc. Uh, but you can also uh, use a QR code, and they're going to put the QR code up here on the screen. And if you use that QR code, you can order them online. You can actually do it online. You can do it on online uh, later on. And so I was trying to figure out. Where, you go to livinginbabylon.com. I need someone to tell me. I thought the QR code was on this piece of, on this card, and I can't find it. So, okay. Um, let me see if I've got it here. There we are. There's a the QR code. Uh, so we'll put that up on the screen for you during the break, and then you can order online. And go to livinginbabylon.com if you want to order later, but I encourage you to get that done tonight. And your free Answers TV subscription will come in about... Well, it has to go back to the States. They have to process it and then send it back to you. That's why we need your email address to be able to do that. So it could take a week or two, but you will get it. And then at the end, we will give you the free Bibles. And again, I want to thank Vision Christian Radio for all they do to, to partner with us. And watch the live stream from Melbourne. If you miss the others, you can go back and watch them there on livinginbabylon.com. So there we are. I'm going to hand back to uh, Dan. Could you put your hands together for Ken? <clears throat> Thank you, Ken. What, what a legend. So we're going to take intermission now, and uh, this is an opportunity for you to submit questions uh, to Ken for the Q&A. So the, uh, on the, the two sides, you'll have the Slido uh, for your questions. And uh, in the centre, we'll keep that QR code for the bookstore if you're ordering uh, from your seats, which you can. So you have 30 minutes to be back with your uploaded questions and to be ready for Martin Isles. Thank you.
Welcome to Building Blocks. If this is more dense, it should flow down and extinguish all of these candles. She depends on the warm sunshine to warm her up or the cool shade to cool her down. If I were still teaching worldview classes in high school, I would show this movie. You can't Christianize a worldview that has a wrong foundation. Welcome to our program. It's called Out and About, and I'm your host, Buddy Davis. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is I Can See. It's really important for every Christian to understand this issue. This is gonna be so fun. Oh, I can't wait. It sounds like a blast. How about you? Getting excited yet? Of course. You know me. I'm up for literally anything, even if it might be a little boring. What? Boring? Gracie, tell her. Yeah, were you not listening? There's so much to do. Zip lines, ice cream, virtual reality, a zoo, and just wait till you go inside. <laughs> I guess you'll just have to see it for yourself. Well, Liz, here we are. The big moment of truth. <gasps> wow. Increíble. <laughs> Buenazo. Pretty uh, amazing, isn't it? Let's do this. <laughs> Try and keep up, girls. Told you, Izzy. Sometimes you just gotta think bigger. Ah, <sighs> it sure is good to be back.
we're coming up the drainage here of Carbon Creek. We've got to go left and climb up this scree slope where there's steps. The question we want to answer with this research was whether the, the sediments were still soft or had they hardened when the rocks were bent. You would expect if the folding took place 480 million years later, those rocks would have broken. They were brittle and they would have fractured and broken when they were bent, which isn't what we observe megascopically. So the only way to be able to investigate this is to actually take samples Look at the grains and the texture under the microscope. We can't find any detailed uh, analysis of this rock layer in the literature. So, it, you know, it hasn't even been done. And you would think the Grand Canyon, of all places, the mecca of geologists, some of the basics haven't been done. Well, it's just an interesting area that we want to try to, to sample. So we're going to take a sample right where this bed is kind of smeared up in here. It's heavy. And so, yes, I have high hopes that this project will confirm that the layers were soft when they were bent and therefore, because the whole sequence of layers had to be formed before the folding took place, it wasn't over, you know, 480 million years, it was only over the time span of the flood. As a Christian, I believe that God's word is a record, an eyewitness account of what happened. And therefore, as a scientist, I can expect that the evidence in God's world is going to confirm what we already read in his word. Well done. Yeah. Well, Andrew, here we are. What do you have to say? Well done, everyone. Fantastic trip.
You ready to impress these guys? Of course. This is the Creation Museum. Prepare to believe. Want to see some dinosaurs? Unbelievable. Want to see Eden? Come on, it's almost time for the show. This is the Creation Museum. Prepare to believe.
welcome back. I would like you to invite you to find your way to your seat, but also uh, stand, and we're going to worship again. You sung so beautifully earlier. I'm looking forward to singing with you again. Please stand. be seated. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, 
and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end and the kingdom, and the dominion, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven 
shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Well, good evening, Perth. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and so far, you have been, I think, the most animated crowd that we've had on this tour. So that's good. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to repeat that for someone. So there are some very special children out there in the world tonight. Uh, they're watching from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, of course, we're in Australia. I've been around the world so many times I've forgotten. Uh, I could just say, watching from Brisbane, their names are Adelaide, Henry, Elizabeth, Rosamond, and Frederick and London and Geoffrey, and Joseph and William and Hannah. And so I want you to give an applause for them. No. I knew you would oblige. Thank you. And kids, now you're all famous. All right. Hey, uh, normally I would start a, a living in Babylon style talk by going into the main features of those cultures that the Bible calls Babylon. Uh, and I go through Genesis chapter 11, the city of Babel, which is the first, uh, and it gives us some of the founding philosophies of Babel, uh, which was its pride, uh, its rebellion, uh, its uh, underlying anxieties and the fact that it's judged. And then I would move into the book of Revelation 17 and 18, where we see the last Babylon, Babylon the Great, uh, wherever that is, whatever that is, I won't go into. Uh, but there we see that there's a couple of other features which are relevant. For example, uh, that these cultures seek to persecute the testimony of Jesus Christ, uh, because the woman Babylon is drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She is hostile to Christian testimony. And we talk about that a little bit. But then we'd also see that she is depicted as a seductress and she's offering the peoples of the earth a good time. Uh, she's holding out the things that she has, the things that she offers uh, in wealth and in prosperity and in progress and in, you know, all this stuff, bread and circuses and all the rest, because everybody in a Babylon culture can have some kind of access to that kind of thing. Uh, the ordinary person can do so, and that's not the case in all cultures. And what she does is she wants to put people to spiritual sleep with a good time and a good life. Uh, and so secularism rises with wealth. Uh, and so people go to sleep and they forget about God because life is too good. Uh, but of course, what she does is she comes along to Christians and says, oh, all of that conviction that you have, uh, you know, you could really stand on that conviction uh, and maybe it'll cost you something or you could just give it up and you can have all the good things that I'm offering you and you don't need to suffer for one second. And that's what I call the Babylon choice, the Daniel on his first day, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They're there minding their business, living out their Christian testimony and suddenly Babylon comes along and says to them, hey, wouldn't it be a shame if that place in the King's University got lost? Wouldn't it be a shame if your governorship uh, over the provinces got lost? Wouldn't it be a shame if you were out of favor with important people? Wouldn't it be a shame if you got killed and that's how far it went? But you don't have to bear the cost. You can simply do a small thing. You can simply compromise, simply eat the food, Daniel. Simply bow, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Maybe say a prayer to God in your head, but bow outwardly. Fake it, come on, you can do it. Um, you see, that's what Babylon cultures do to us. They come along and say, for a little compromise, you can have a good time. For a little compromise, you don't have to lose anything. And we've talked a lot about that Babylon choice uh, in Adelaide uh, with the fiery furnace episode uh, and in Brisbane as well with the terrible chapter of Daniel 5 where God moves in judgment and we looked at what ultimately matters and the choices we'll regret one day in the future, whereas the choices we'll be so glad we made. Um, actually, to summarize that, 
Uh, it is interesting, isn't it? In Daniel chapter 5, this is where the Feast of Belshazzar happens and the hand appears and writes on the wall and it's all over. It's judged. Every Babylon is judged. Uh, and Belshazzar wants to know the meaning of the writing. And he says, whoever can tell me the meaning of this writing, I'll give him a gold chain for his neck and a purple robe and he'll be the third ruler in the kingdom. And of course, you, the reader, are like, huh, how stupid is that? It's all over. Who wants a purple robe and a gold chain and a third rulership in the kingdom of Babylon when it's all going to be dead tonight? Which it was. Babylon's last day. It's interesting, isn't it? On the last day, that's the kind of perspective you have about Babylon's seductions. But on the first day, the same things exactly looked so enticing, didn't they? The same things exactly could have made Daniel and his friends compromise their testimony for Christ to get a hold of them. You know, wisdom living in a culture like this is to have that perspective we will have on the last day, today. And then we will live for that which is of eternal value. Now, you know what's of eternal value? Human souls. If we are living for the last day, we will value human souls and we will want to see them there. We'll do something about evangelism. Um, we will be the light of the world. No matter what pressure comes upon us, we won't put that light under the basket. We'll make sure that we're seen in this culture for who we are and what we are. Um, and not only that, we'll go all the way, won't we? Uh, what does it say about the light of the world? It says uh, the whole point is that people would see your good works because you're out there and active as a witness and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So you won't just do good works, you'll tell them why you're doing the good works. Because what's the point? The point is not the good works, the point is the glory of God, the salvation of souls. And that is why your ordinary, daily, mundane Christian life can have such an impact. Um, because people can look at you and ask questions about you. And you want to make sure they know why you are what you are. It's interesting, this is what happened in Daniel chapter 6, which I'm hoping to talk about in Melbourne. Um, in Daniel chapter 6, it's very interesting, that's the lion's den chapter. At the end of the chapter, you get this moment where King Darius makes a decree and he says, let everyone worship the God of Daniel. I think, my goodness, how did that happen? Uh, how did the king of a pagan empire make a decree like that to all the known world? Do you know how it happened? It started, go back to the beginning of the chapter, it started with Daniel being good at his job. Isn't that extraordinary? It started with a guy who knew that he was where he was in life because God had put him there. And he took it seriously. And he was so good at his job that King Darius said, gee, I think I might promote this guy. And of course, jealousy kicks in. And once the jealousy has kicked in, they're all starting to try and undermine him. Can't find any dirt on the guy, he's too good. Again, he's taking it seriously. And then, of course, the Babylon choice comes his way. Hey, just draw the blinds when you pray, and you'll be fine. 30 days, pray to no God but Darius. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? He didn't even draw the blinds. I've often wondered about that. Didn't even draw the blinds. Do you know why? I think it must have been because it was his practice to have the blinds open. And he already had a sense of what Jesus would say many years later, don't hide your light under a basket. Don't shrink back. Don't hide because of the threats and the hostilities in that Babylon choice. He made the right decision. And it's interesting, in the book of Daniel, what you see is that God's most powerful and God's most fruitful works are done in the lion's dens and the fiery furnaces. Um, when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were given that choice, of whether they would bow or not, and if they don't bow, they're going to go to the fiery furnace, they said, well, our God is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, or not. Either way, we're not going to bow. But it's interesting, isn't it? When we make these choices, when we take these stands, it is very often the case that it doesn't go the way we expected, and we need to be ready for that. We need not fear in these moments because God takes control. And a third thing happened, something that they never seem to have anticipated. They weren't delivered from the furnace, they were delivered in the furnace. 
And you just don't know, God might bring that lion's den moment, that Babylon choice your way, because He wants someone to stand. And it's in those moments that He does the work of all works in times like this. He does a work in you. It's interesting, um, in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they had their bonds loosed, they were free. Interesting observation by Nebuchadnezzar, they're free, he says, they're unbound. And you know, all those things of this world that Babylon's seducing you with that would hold you back from taking a stand, their power over you is taken away in those moments because you stand with Christ in the fire and all of a sudden you're free. And God will do that work in you to draw you to Him and sanctify you and make you the person He wishes you to be, but He will also do the work through you. And the outcome of each of those episodes was extraordinary testimony for, Christ, for God uh, in, 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 a, in a godless and a, and a pagan place. Uh, and I get passionate about that because it's my experience of the last few years. I saw that time and again when those moments came that people would shrink back from and find too hard and too challenging and they don't have the courage. You know what? Firstly, God gives you the courage. God helps you to make the stand. And if you do, He uses you powerfully. Um, Anyway, I said I wasn't going to say that, but I just did. Um, <laughs> let me go back to what I was going to say. Um, what is it that's going on in the book of Daniel? What is it that these amazing individuals like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are showing us? They are showing us that there is two ultimate allegiances by which we can live our life. There are two ultimate powers which we can serve in our life, and it's one or it's the other. There's no middle ground. And in Daniel chapter 7, we come across this reality that there are two ultimate powers at work over and within this world in which we are living. And if we can see those powers and we can decide this day whom we shall serve, then we'll be on the right track. And it starts in verse 1 of chapter 7, where it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. And you go, okay, we've reached a point in the book where something's happened. We've fallen out of chronological order. In chronological order, all the way up to chapter 6, which is up to Cyrus, just mentioned at the end, Cyrus the Persian. And then all of a sudden, we're back before chapter 5, the first year of Belshazzar's reign. You go, okay, this is no longer chronological. Why? Because from Daniel 7 to the end, we get history from another perspective. We realize through the book of Daniel as a whole, through its structure, that history can be observed from two perspectives, two standpoints. It can be observed from our perspective, the perspective that we are given by our five senses in this world, the things that are happening around us that we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Ah, uh, but that's not all. Exactly the same history can be observed in a different way. And that's why the Bible has a kind of literature called apocalyptic, which always gets so controversial. Don't worry, we're not gonna to do too much controversy tonight. Uh, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, this apocalyptic genre of literature, what is it? It's, it's history, but it's, from, it's, it's, a, it's a history that is seen through the unveiling of God of another perspective entirely. And it's, God's, it's the perspective of eternity. It's the spiritual perspective of the workings of God and angels and demons and devils of hell all around us, all the time, which we do not see every day. And Daniel 7 through 12 is an unveiling of that history from another perspective in another world. And what we find, actually, is that it's this history, this perspective of history which God unveils to us, which is the higher perspective in the sense that it is that world, the spiritual world, which is playing out on the one hand, and as a response to that, life in this world is changing. Um, and so what a privilege to see behind the curtain into what is happening from God's perspective. You know, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were privileged 
in their time because they did get little flashes of insight into the fact that there was this other world. They got flashes of insight into the fact that there was a parallel reality unfolding which was driving their own reality. You remember the fourth man in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar looks in the fire and he says, there's a fourth man and he looks like the son of God. Well, he might have been right on the money with that one. Um, and they get a flash of the fact that, aha, uh -huh, there's a realm in which God is at work for us. There's a realm in which God is at work for this world. Uh, you see another example when Daniel goes to the lion's den and what happens? An angel comes and shuts the lion's mouths. But just as well, we get another glimpse. God is at work for the sake of this world. There's another reality. Uh, what about uh, when Daniel prays? And his prayer doesn't get answered and he prays some more and days and days pass. And who shows up? The angel Gabriel. And he says, apologies that I was late. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm late, he says. I was doing battle with some demons and I got delayed. Uh, the Prince of Persia, he says. And it's an interesting study on, anyway, demons and nations and the way the Bible describes that in, in, in some places. Um, but you get this sudden flash of, oh, this is not all there is. There's more going on. And there's a greater reality still than the reality that you and I see. You know, it adds new meaning to uh, what Jesus said about the life of faith. Blessed are those who, who have not seen and yet believed. Uh, of course, there's a specific application of that, which is not seeing the risen Christ. But there's a sense in which the life of faith is a, is a life in which there is a lot of things we can't see. But we know that those things are happening. And we get flashes from time to time. And so we can be encouraged, you know, in our own experience of living in a culture that's looking more and more like the Babylon cultures of the Bible every day, because we can be encouraged by the fact that we are guaranteed three greater realities. First of all, the ministry of angels. Second of all, the presence of Jesus Christ. And third of all, the overarching rule of God in all things. We are not alone. We are not powerless. We are not defeated. The things we see in this world that war against us are nothing compared to the angel armies that are on our side. You know, this is why Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that they were never alone when they did right. Uh, three men in Daniel chapter 3 versus all the other officials, very lonely, oh no, Son of God came from heaven and stood with those men in the fire. Um, we are never alone. We are the recipients of the ministry of angels. Um, it's interesting, Hebrews 1.14 says, are they not ministering spirits? sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? That's why Elisha could say to his servant, Lord, open his eyes. And he saw a whole mountainside of angel armies. More are they that are for us than they that are against us. You know, I was listening to a preacher on Daniel chapter 3, The Fiery Furnace, and... He was talking about the debate about whether the fourth figure in the fire is in fact the Son of God or if it's an angel. Uh, and he admitted at the final analysis, you couldn't really be sure from the text, but he said, you know what? He said, even if there was no fourth man mentioned in the text, I would know that the Son of God was there. Because Jesus said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And one plus Christ is a majority. It's interesting, isn't it? And an encouraging thing to know that, and I, I often put it this way, and it takes a bit of thinking sometimes. It's like eternity is right at your elbow. Eternity is right at the tip of your nose. There's another world. You know, if you had the eyes to see like Elisha's servant and you could see this room, you would see dreadful things and glorious things right here, right now. You know, there are people in this room whose hearts are being hardened and there is a demon behind their chair. Do you know, I've actually been in situations where I've sensed that enormously. Um, 
I was in a tragic circumstance once where I was out bushwalking and I came across a man uh, who was suicidal uh, and he was trying to uh, end his life. And I had to sit with him and talk with him and it was quite extraordinary. I've reflected on this a lot. Um, I talked to him for hours and there was such a thick darkness. Um, he was angry, he was brooding, he was resentful, uh, saying terrible things, he was threatening, uh, all this kind of thing. And it went on, and it went on, and it went on, and it went on. Until suddenly, I, I was getting to the end of my tether, I was thinking, what am I going to do? Suddenly I started speaking to him about what the Scriptures say about our sinfulness. Because I'd run out of other things to, to, to challenge him with. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just go for the gospel, I'll go for broke. Um, and so I did, I went for broke, I went with the gospel. And I started telling him about his sin, I started reciting the things he'd told me in the conversation, which showed that he was a person with a dark heart. And it was incredible, all of a sudden, the heaviness disappeared. It was like whatever was there ran away. And it suddenly occurred to me, there is a battle for this man's life right now. I am not alone. He is not alone on this hill. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing to experience and I pray that for that man, that enlightenment, that work of God that happened was something that had permanent results. But you see, there is an unseen world, right? But the extraordinary thing is that whilst that unseen world has terrible things in it, um, whilst but that, that unseen world also has extraordinary glory in it. Uh, and it's interesting, the Scriptures say that that unseen world is something that is being ordered for the good of them that love Christ. He orders all things, how? In the unseen world. For the good of them that love Christ and are called according to His purpose. And you know, ever since I studied this, I've, I've taken up the practice of thanking God for what He's doing for me that I can't see. What He's doing for me in a complex of forces that are beyond me, but I praise God that He is there. And it's interesting, it's so foolish, isn't it? People in this world think that they are in charge. People in this world think that they're the highest thing, the most powerful thing, all there is. Uh, and you know, I was in politics for a long time, and you go to the political centres, and I was saying in Brisbane, you go into the parliament houses of the world, into the secure areas, and people walk uncommonly tall in those areas, you know? They uh, feel pretty good about themselves. They're one of the few that's made it to the place of power. And they think, yeah, I'm in charge. I'm all there is. You know, all this is brought to nothing by the powers of God Almighty which lie in this other world. And you know, the Scriptures are saying to us, say to us that... His reign and His rule over all things in the spiritual realm is ultimate. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a tension, isn't there? I mean, I talk about this spiritual conflict, this spiritual battle. I talk about the way in which it plays out in this world with good and evil being done at the same time and, you know, challenges like that. Well, you say, well, who's the strongest? Um, What's well, interesting, the Bible says in one hand that um, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Um, it says that he has an authority, he has a rule, he has a kingdom. The whole earth lies in the wicked one. You go, oh, is Satan the strongest? Uh, but see, here's the thing. The ultimate, the ultimate power is God's. And I know that because there are small victories of evil in this world. There are things that happen that are genuinely bad. But you know whose will is served by everything? ultimately, whose plan is edged closer to the finish line by everything, it's God's plan. And that's how He puts the powers of evil to shame. That's how He puts the powers of evil down. Because whatever they do, somehow they can never win the battle. Somehow they can never get their ends. Um, I always say, you know, um, they can never win ultimately. Uh, Joseph knew this. He said, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. 
In other words, he said, bad things happened, and you did bad things. But you know what? Evil never serves its own ends. Evil ultimately even serves God's ends. He doesn't uh, create evil. He doesn't commission evil. But somehow, it can never get the ascendancy, and his plan always marches on. You know, this is what Daniel 7 is all about. A clash of kingdoms, a clash of powers... A clash that is happening in the unseen world first and playing out in the seen world second. And this is the certainty. Only one will prevail ultimately. Only one will endure forever. And the other one is doomed. And so the question I want to ask, which will be answered over the ensuing minutes, is... Which side are you on? Which kingdom are you serving today? I want to bring that back to the forefront of our consideration. But I want to show us first the details of how this is playing out in Daniel. You notice first of all that there is this this image of the four winds of heaven blowing on the great sea. And four beasts come up out of the sea and you say, okay, we're in the land of images now, Uh, we're in the unseen world where we need a new perspective to understand what's going on. Well, it's helpful, isn't it, that verse 17 of the same chapter tells us that the great sea uh, is the earth or the world. It is the trouble and the stirring and the billowing of mankind on the earth. And that's a pretty good summary of history, isn't it? History is a troubled tale. History is a tale of strivings, of strife, of challenge, of restlessness. You think of the sea bubbling and and tossing, and it's a powerful thing that is swirling all the time. And you think that's the trouble of this fallen world. That's the trouble of man in sin, striving for power and engaging in conflicts and falling out with each other and all the rest of it. Um, This is mankind in the fallen world. This is the earth in the fall. Okay, what's happening to this sea? Well, the four winds of heaven are blowing on the sea. And you say, well, what are the four winds of heaven? Well, again, we're very fortunate that this is one that's not hard to understand because this same image is used in many, many, many places in Scripture and it always refers to God's activity. God's power is at work in the world of humankind. He is acting. We know that. But it's interesting, isn't it? God's power is blowing on the earth. He's moving in strength. What happens in reply? Do you know the reply is this? Four great beasts come up out of the sea. Um, And we see in verse 17 that these are four kings representing earthly powers. The earth produces them, they rise up uh, from among us and they act in opposition to God's four winds of activity. They organize and they oppose this activity of God to make hostile powers, to make hostile cultures, societies, systems and people, like the Babylons of the world, right? They themselves are produced by a fallen world. They are described as beasts and they are organizing people against the work of God. There's a lesson from this. The lesson is first, well, there's several lessons, but let me give you the first one. The action of heaven on earth stirs up evil in reply. This is the unchanged pattern of history. When God moves, Satan notices. If heaven is there, hell will quickly seek to be there too. Do you want to do a work for God in this place? Then get this memo, there will be opposition. Do not ever be naive about that reality. And by the way, this is why every Christian life, even if it's lived out only 1% of its potential, 
can expect some kind of opposition at some stage. All who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, says the Apostle Paul. You say, I've never had any opposition whatsoever. I've never had anyone, any kind of rejection. I've never had any kind of, of, of anybody reproach me. I've never had anything like this. Well, hang on. You've got a problem on your hands. Even Winston Churchill knew that if you're going to do anything right, then you can expect opposition. It's a fact of life. You want to do a work for God, you will face some of the things that are sort of told to us in the scriptures. Um, Daniel, doing a work for God in his work, faces the lion's den. Job, it's interesting, isn't it? What did Job do wrong? Nothing. And really, it's very clear in the text, it says it over and over again that the answer is nothing. And you say, well, hang on, why did he face all that trouble? Exactly. He did nothing wrong. And Satan was incited against him simply because he was upright, fearing God, turning away from evil, to quote the text. Understand that. God was working to raise up a deliverer in Egypt. What does Pharaoh do? What does Satan do? He incites Pharaoh to try and kill all the Hebrew boys and get the midwives to get in on the act. But it's interesting, isn't it? I said before that evil never has its own way ultimately. That's such a great example because Pharaoh puts out this sort of command, kill all the Hebrew boys. And so what happens? Well, Moses' mother thinks, oh help, I've got to hide my baby. So she hides the baby in the bulrushes. And so what happens is Pharaoh's own daughter finds him, raises him in the palace, and that is the very thing which qualifies him to be the very deliverer that God was going to send, which Satan tried to stop. It's an extraordinary. Yeah. Um, never forget that truth which I just went to which is that in the face of all this competing power this is your hope, this is your optimism God's throne is always the ultimate power it is always the highest power and you know what, it plays out in ways that we don't understand which seem awfully mysterious to us right, but As your life goes on, like Joseph, you start to realize, oh yes, God's throne is the higher power. It is the ultimate power. Um, Therefore, this opposition will never be ultimate. Never. Actually, um, this tells us that we must never shy away from standing with Christ in the fires. What a foolish thing. To compromise, what for? To compromise for something which is not ultimate, which will be destroyed and is doomed, right? And what you did in service of it will be destroyed and doomed as well. Um, Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. How do you do that? You serve the one who stood with them in the fire. And you know what? You face the fire and you come out better for it but also you have an ultimate destiny which is only enhanced and only made greater. You know, one of the first things I say to young people when they come and do our programs for youth, uh, you know, one of the challenges particularly youth from Australia have is that they understand that they, if they're strong Christians, they understand they believe things that the culture doesn't very much like them believing. Um, And they struggle with the fact they're going out to a secular university or they're going into a secular workplace and there's this lurking fear, what if they don't like me? Uh, what, if, what if I face rejection? What if, what if they come up to me and say, hey, what do you think about, you know, fill in the blank with controversial social issue here, what do you think about uh, transgenderism? <gasps> Uh-oh. Uh, and then you give like a non-answer, like, well, I believe God loves everyone. Bang, you're caught. They know exactly what you didn't say, right? Of course you believe God loves everyone. Of course, that's the point. But they want to know more. And this is the problem. You find yourself in this situation where you're worried. Well, the first thing just to understand, to give you a little bit of confidence, is that opposition is a feature, it is not a bug in the Christian life. Um, I think that's adapting a quote from Steve Jobs, isn't it? Um, Redeeming the quote for a good purpose. It's a feature, it's not a bug, right? Uh, And here's the other lesson that comes out of all of this. Never be stupid enough to to adopt an appeasement strategy. Never ever be silly enough. Yeah. (laughs) 
That's good, because it emphasizes the point, and I actually want it emphasized. Um, it, is, it is so crazy when you see this sort of threat come along, or you see this opposition arise, uh, and people sit there and go, or oh, maybe we can go it or make it go away. You haven't understood the nature of this world. The four winds of heaven blow and evil responds. That's the simple reality of life. And you sit there and go, oh, I know, we can compromise until uh, the evil response stops. In other words, you've compromised to the point where you're no longer a threat to the powers of darkness. Congratulations. You mustn't ever take that approach. And we do have people who actually think that they, by making uh, the truth and by making the gospel more attractive to the world, they will get more people in. It never, ever, 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 ever has worked that way. Never. If you make the gospel attractive to people, you're making it attractive to people in sin. And therefore, it's not the gospel at all. Okay? Never adopt an appeasement strategy. This is the world we live in. Okay. In the passage, however, there is a very specific kind of stirring of the waters that's being referred to. Uh, It's the creation of these powers that engage in organized opposition to the winds of God. And you see four of these powers depicted in four beasts. Um, And I think I can largely explain this without crossing over any really controversial territory. So that's good. Um, If we get to somewhere like Daniel 9, we'll be in real trouble. Uh, But we're not there yet. Um, The first beast, interestingly, is like a lion, it has eagle's wings, and then its wings are plucked off and it's lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man is given to it. Now, this sounds a lot like Babylon, the very kingdom, the very power in which Daniel is living, and it would make sense, right? Because Daniel chapter 2, there's Nebuchadnezzar's dream where there's the great statue and there's the head of gold, the first power, the first empire. What is it? It's Nebuchadnezzar, okay? This is really the same sort of thing. Um, seen from a different perspective. Uh, And it's interesting because Babylon used the symbol of a lion. And it's also interesting because Babylon was famous and feared for its swiftness and speed. And you notice the wings of the eagle. Uh, You know, if you read in Habakkuk 1, it says, their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They gather captives like sand. They sweep by like the wind and go on. This was a big part of the fear of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. But also there's this fascinating reference, isn't there, to the fact that uh, this beast, at some point, is given a new mind and dignified and made to stand on two feet. And its beastliness is taken away. Now there's a reference to Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. You read Daniel chapter four and you see Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, how that God worked with him and humbled him and brought him, and he actually literally gave, struck him down with lycanthropy, made him think he was a beast, eating grass and wet with the dew of heaven, until he's restored to his right mind, and he's gloriously turned into one who fears God, and says his kingdom will endure forever, and I believe we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. It's an amazing image, Um, and then there's a second beast, and this one's a bear, and there's an interesting feature, it's lopsided, it's got two long legs on one side, two short legs on the other, That's a bit weird. Well, it's interesting, the empire that followed Babylon, as we saw in Daniel with Darius and Cyrus, was a lopsided empire. It was the Medo-Persian empire. One was bigger and one was smaller. This is before Medo-Persia even conquered Babylon. Isn't that extraordinary? And then you go along and there's a third beast and this one's like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back and the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. Notice this one's got four wings, not two. Notice this one's a leopard, not a lion, it's faster. Do you know the next empire that followed Medo-Persia was Greece? And do you know what was absolutely, in the history books to this day, the absolute most famous thing about Alexander the Great, the head of the Greek Empire, was his unbelievable speed of conquest. He moved across the known world in all directions, foreheads, incredible speed, so quickly that he was 30 years old and he ruled the world. Isn't that amazing? And this before Alexander the Great even existed. Uh, And then you read the next one, the fourth beast. This one's terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what what was left with its feet. 
Now, there might be different, I think there's two opinions about this one, uh, but the main one is that, well, it's just the next one, uh, Greece and now Rome, right? That was the next one. Um, and what do the historians tell us about Rome? Rome was famous for the wholesale destruction of the territories that they conquered and the replacement with Roman infrastructure, Roman systems, Roman everything. And this beast is stamping. This beast is breaking. It's got that crushing destruction. You think, well, that would, that would work, wouldn't it? Um, extraordinary, again, well before Rome. But then there's this controversial matter which I don't know the answer to, which is that from this beast come ten horns. Uh, and of those ten horns, three of them get uprooted by another one, a little horn that has eyes and a mouth that speak great things. And you think, wow, we really are in the land of apocalypse now. Uh, these are some interesting images. What are the ten horns? Look, there'll be people on the live chat and all that probably saying, they're this, they're that, they're the other. The truth is, nobody really knows, nobody can really agree. Uh, there's theories, there's ideas, they've all got problems. And here's the reality. When something in eschatology is like that, when you actually can't, there's no obvious way to know. Uh, it, it really is individual speculation and a, and a pantheon of theories. I would just say, it's probably not that helpful to get over-distracted by it. Because the scriptures are meant to give us clarity. They're meant to reveal things to us. Uh, they're meant to help us to see the world clearly. And if it's going to be an endless distraction of theory and you're going to fight with everyone about it, it's probably, you know, by all means, pursue it as an individual interest. But let's not get too tied up with it. I, I, you know, personally, my suspicion is we can't see it because it hasn't finished yet. That's my personal suspicion. You know, it's very hard to see a circumstance from inside, right? Uh, it's really after the fact that you look back and you go, oh, of course. Even the identity of Jesus was like that. At the time, not many people could see it. I mean, the Messiah doesn't die on a cross. Didn't make any sense. Oh, but after the fact, oh, of course. Uh, and that's the kind of way knowledge works. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But I want to focus in on this little horn. Um, this, this little horn that comes up, um, he is less marked by beastly and rapacious violence. He's more marked by a keen eye and a talking mouth. And the mouth is boastful, it is proud, it is blasphemous, it is arrogant. And his animosity and violence is targeted more specifically. It's not, it's not just violence against the earth in conquest. It's a special kind of violence. It's against the saints of the Most High. It's against a people group. So violence is replaced as the core modus operandi with boast, speaking pompous things, proud things, blasphemous things, says the text. Now, there's, it's not either or, there's both. But that's the overarching emphasis on this figure. Now, this figure, it's relatively uncontroversially accepted, is a figure called Antichrist in Scripture. Now, who the Antichrist is, that's the controversial bit. I'm not going to answer the question. Um, because we don't need to. And we don't need to because in the Scriptures we learn something, which is that there is the Antichrist and then there are Antichrists. There are mimics. There are sort of like appetizers all along the way. Uh, and that's in the book of First John. And so this really brings my point home from all of this. Whatever your views are on the little details, um, and they probably are basically what I just said, um, that vision has given us insight into the recurring pattern of this world's history. Namely, that it is a history characterized by the Earth's production of powerful beasts and blasphemers until God moves in the final judgment and His kingdom emerges alone and victorious, vested in the Son of Man. That's the wonderful big picture you get from a prophecy like this. Whatever details you put on it, and isn't that encouraging? Uh, and you look at other eschatological passages, apocalyptic passages, beasts, blasphemers. Those are the powers that rule. And all the while, there is a conflict between two ultimate powers, which is revealed to us here. God is moving on the sea. The sea is fighting back. 
The four winds blow on the sea and the beasts rise to organize the sea in opposition. There's a vicious clash of kingdoms. And on the one hand, the kingdoms of this world, which are the domain of the beasts and the blasphemers, and on the other hand, the kingdom of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Or as Revelation says, the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And they both exist. They are both in a battle to the death, and it is Christ and His saints that will emerge victorious. That's the sweep of world history. Now, applications. Are there beasts and blasphemers around today? You bet there are. Um, Chinese Communist Party? Pretty beastly. Um, go back a little bit to the Adolf Hitler and the Marxist dictators, and all, pretty beastly. Uh, it's really right up to the present day. Are there blasphemers? Well, yes. Um, Nero, back in the day? Um, or up in the present day, I mean, take someone, well, we're going to get into this in a minute, but just as an appetizer for this, um, what about someone like Gavin Newsom, governor of California, who quotes Jesus to promote abortion on billboards in California? Now, that's pretty arrogant. That's speaking pompous things against the Most High. We see a lot of that in our day, and we're going to see that in a minute. But let me ask you this question. When you look at powers... When you look at these organized systems of might and strength in the world, do you see them for what they are? Do you admire power? Do you desire power? Are you in awe and do you marvel at the organized powers of men? There is something quite objectively great about powers. But never let that get away on you. Uh, you know, I lived in Canberra for 10 years. I lost track of the number of young people, sort of 18, 19, coming into Canberra to take jobs in political offices. And ultimately, at the core of it all, it's because they actually lusted after power. And they sometimes didn't even know that about themselves. They were drawn to it like moths to the light. Very concerning feature to have, by the way. And it's why when I was in politics, I always looked for people who were there by accident. I never looked for people who wanted it and sought it out. Uh, and it's the accidental politicians that you find are actually the good ones. Uh, and they see things for what they are. You know, always temper your view with God's statements that these are beasts and they are blasphemers. Um, and you know, on the blasphemy side, which is so relevant today, the pompous side, this little horn... You know, it says here that he shall speak words against the Most High. It says he shall think to change the times and the law. You think, what does that mean? You know, taken as a phrase, seeking to change the times, the seasons, and the law. I read that and I thought, I wonder if that's talking about natural law, the laws of God. And then I found a guy who wrote, one of the greatest Old Testament scholars in history, wrote centuries ago, Carl Kiel is his name, before our present cultural moment was on us, and he said what this means in the original is, the foundations and the main conditions emanating from God of the life and actions of man in the world. In other words, God's creation blueprints for the way life is meant to be lived and the way life is meant to play out today. He shall seek to change those. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I said there's antichrist and there's antichrists. Do you think maybe we live in an age of antichrist? I mean, let's take a really obvious one. Changing the law that defines what marriage is. Who created it? God did. Who, like, put a testimony in men and women in their biology and their psychology and everything and their desire to be with each other that tells us God made marriage in creation as a reality of this world? It's there. But what do we do? We come along and say, no, we'll change that. We will do something pompous. <laughs> we'll change it. Because we think we can organize the sea in opposition to God's creation blueprint. Um, it's the same, too, with the gender issue. And I speak about these things quite dogmatically, <clears throat> but I understand that these are uh, things which have wrapped many people up in real deception and confusion and difficulty today.
But what is behind them? What is the driving thought of those who would come along and say, oh, I know, let's change these definitions. Let's change what male is. Let's change what female is. Let's find ways in culture, in technology, in medical technology, in education, in power, to redefine what God has already refined, to change the creation blueprints which govern life. I look at this room, is there anything more evident from God's creation that he made males and females? Now you say, well, so what? What does that mean? Well, the Bible tells us what it means. It means that God meant that for our good. Um, that's why you and I know the broken pathway down which that change will lead people, especially young people. And as time moves on and this thing sort of gets more and more ventilated in courtrooms and so on, the evidence is damning. The evidence is horrendous. Uh, the shutting down of the Tavistock Clinic in London and all that kind of thing. Why? Because children's lives are being destroyed without God's blueprint. Um, there is a man who lived as a transgender woman for many years in the United States of America. His name is Walt Heyer. Many of you might have heard of him. And after many years, he came out the other side of that and realized that, you know, he didn't feel like a real man once, and he certainly would never feel like a real woman. And it never solved his problems. And so he started a ministry called Transgender Regret. He just put a website up, Transgender Regret, so people would Google it and find him so that he could take calls and emails and help people who were in the same position as him. You know, he has now counseled, met with, helped thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, and the stories he tells are harrowing from, you know, two days post-op all the way up to many years. Uh, can you imagine the realization? Because you can't go back. Um, two days. Uh, because clinicians and the medical establishment and all that kind of thing pushed them down a certain line. And at one point, he was forwarding me emails from people here in Australia um, who needed help, who'd reached out to him, but he's based in America. And those emails are the most single most tragic things I have ever read in all my life, and I am quite sure will ever read in all my life. There is such a darkness associated with this self-destructive force. Why? Well, it's antichrist. It's the opposite of what God has asked. And people are sadly deceived, and there's the wrong ideas out there, and it's leading to destruction. It's the same with so many issues. Um, you can think about uh, the issue of race, as Ken has mentioned. There's one human race, but we make all our racial differences into more than they are. The Apostle Paul got the memo right on that in Acts chapter 17 when he went to the Greeks and said, well, God made from one man uh, all the people of the earth, uh, so that they would, and he set the boundaries of their dwelling places and habitations. Therefore, he sent one man to save us all. Therefore, there's one gospel, one truth, one salvation. Lived experience doesn't overcome the one truth that God has set for all people. Um, that's the greatest equality in the world. Uh, and that's why churches in this country are probably the most multiracial environments on earth. Um, it's a reality. Um, and there's so many. I mean, I could go to the pro-life issue. When does life start? Well, God's told us in through his creation work. It's made in God's image. It's bre inbreathed by God and all that kind of thing. What do we say? Well, we want to have it. We want to decide when life begins. If life's wanted, it should be saved. If life's not wanted, it should be destroyed. We should be pompous enough to have that choice. Uh, it's tragic, isn't it? And again, there's a lot of deception that goes along with that. There's lots of women and men who fall for that and they go through with that kind of action and they live with the guilt. And that's why it's so hard for them to hear people like me say that. Uh, but you know what? I just want to say, anybody who's been deceived on any of these points, um, there is total forgiveness and restoration in Jesus Christ. Uh, nothing's ever hopeless. You know, we have a God who wanted to deal with that so much that he died for it. Um, and so there's always hope. Uh, I could go through so many, but I want to single out this one. What about the issue of truth? Truth is a cr part of God's creation. He made reality. He made truth. And what's the phrase we hear today? My truth. My truth. You know what? We want to change God's very truth into our image. Now, that's blasphemous. That fits the bill. Um, this is anti-Christ because it opposes the authority of Christ 
It was through him that the worlds were created. It is his blueprints. Isn't it relevant to our present day? Uh, This is a feature of all Babylon cultures, from Babel who said, let's make a name for ourselves, let's make ourselves great, greater than God, Uh, all the way through to Belshazzar when Daniel says what his judgment is, he says, you have raised yourself up against the Most High, you've sought to be as superior as he is and do things which only he has the authority to do. And here's the tragedy, it is all about pride, it's all about getting into people's hearts and singing that siren song to them which says, you can decide, you can have the power, you can be the one who opposes God and you will get away with it. Wow, that's tragic. Because do you know what that does? It puffs people up on the inside and when people are puffed up on the inside, they are opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the single most important requirement of the gospel of Jesus Christ is humility. He breaks us down that He might build us up. He convicts us of our sin. He convicts us of what we've done. And maybe there's people here who are convicted about what they've done. Well, good. And it's good because you can now turn to Christ. He's the answer. And He says, God says in the Old Testament, He says, I dwell in the high and the holy place. And where else? With Him who is of a humble and a contrite spirit. The one who know, is contrite, is repentant of their sin, who is humbled in themselves and know that they don't, they know that they don't have truth. They know that they are not the truth. They know that they are not gods. They know that they are sinners. And this is what's happening in our time. Blasphemers are arising from the sea, to use the apocalyptic image, and organizing the sea in opposition to the four winds of God, even making our hearts proud that we might oppose God in these ways and therefore reject the Saviour of the world and His Kingdom which will endure forever, all for the sake of our own power and pride. Um, And the reality is that this culture rubs off on us all. Um, I often talk about the marketing slogans that are out there that are all about human pride. Uh, You know, love yourself, be your best self, believe in yourself, Uh, you're beautiful just as you are, Uh, Christ died for you because you are worth it, Whoa, steady on. Uh, The wonder of what Christ did for you was that He died for you while you were yet a sinner. It's not about you, it's about Him and His incredible character that moved Him to even do it in the first place. And that rubs off on us. And every time I go through some of those slogans, some of those buzzwords, you'll see them in gyms a lot. It's all about the glorification of the self. Uh, But, you know, someone will always send me a photo the next day or or report back to me on something they saw just after the talk. And one of the team members here went to a cafe on the Gold Coast uh, and his waitress was wearing a T-shirt that said, love yourself. Uh, And he asked to pose with a photo with her and sent it to me and said, you're talking action. Um, Great witnessing opportunity, by the way. Uh, This is the world we live in. People are pumped up on pride and it's the culture, right? Yes, it's at the powers that be. Yes, it's part of the organization of the establishment, but hey, it's in your heart and it's in mine. And may God make us people of humility, that Christ might tear out the old and build us back with the new, with Himself. Um, I really need to land the plane. Um, This is the second time I've got into this trouble. I'm going to do it this way. I'm here to tell you, like, it says there that uh, there's the pride, but then it says also that he shall seek to wear out the saints of the Most High, and we talked a lot about that, didn't we? That pressure, that trouble, those difficulties that we face in life, they wear us out. You know, it's hard being one in a woke world, right? Uh, although we know that you're not one, you're with Christ. Uh, but it's difficult, and, you know, people get worn out, and that's why they give in, that's why they fall for the seduction. Uh, and I want to say this, chin up, take heart. Because Daniel experienced that too in his life and the great shock that he received was actually that Babylon wasn't the end, this was the pattern of world history. It's not going to change anytime soon. That wasn't the source of his hope. And by the way, if you're distracted with all the political machinations and happenings of this world, you'll be very depressed. A lot of people watch more sort of political podcasts than sermons. It's a bad balance to have uh, because you're going to be overwhelmed by trouble which you can't control and a world that's going in a way that isn't very comfortable, okay, it wasn't Daniel's hope to look at 
Darius. It wasn't Daniel's hope to look at Belshazzar. Nothing more hopeless in the world. Daniel's hope was to see the higher throne. Daniel's hope was to look up to the greater power that is ordering this world for an ultimate end. And you know, I wonder whether this vision here in Daniel 7, which chronologically happened before Daniel 6, might have been one of the great secrets of his courage in the lion's den. Because he knew he wasn't serving that kingdom. And he knew something more certain was up ahead. And it's described here, he looks above the boiling of the waters and the beasts and the blasphemers, and suddenly thrones are placed. And the Ancient of Days takes his seat. And his clothing is white as snow. He's holy and pure. He has what the world needs, right? Here's the king that we need. And it says his hair of his head is white like pure wool. It's pure, but it's soft, not beastly. And I just wonder where there's a little hint there in God's character of the fact that he is merciful. God's character that actually he is for us. And that is why he has not judged yet. Because he waits, not willing that any should perish. And he sits on this throne of fire, and it's, 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 it's all flaming, and it's got a flamethrower jetting out from the front. Uh, it's really extraordinary. Um, and all of this is to show that actually he comes to destroy all that is wicked, destroy all that is evil, burn up all that has no place in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. But you might say, well, hang on, that's very foreboding. And yes, it is. Because we might all say, oh yes, judgment, we love judgment, we want God to bring justice. Well, as a preacher friend of mine says, if you want to call the garbo, you better climb out of the wheelie bin. <laughs> because here's the problem. <laughs> it's a good illustration, isn't it? <laughs> uh, here's the problem. Sin runs down your heart and mine. And you might call out for justice one day, you better hope that it doesn't come too hard. Because you're going to get the flames in your face as well. And that's the thing people don't realize. They're all out there fighting the oppression and the evil and the badness in the world, forgetting, forgetting that Jesus said, well, where does it all come from? Why are the systems, why is the society so bad? Because society and systems equals a society and system of people like you, and you can't even get on with your mother-in-law. And that's the problem, <laughs> right? I mean, look at, the, look at the tension, the trouble, the stirring, the strife in our own lives. And you wonder why the world is as it is, and we, don't, we are so slow to realize we have hearts of sin. And you say, well, what's the hope? Well, the hope is this, the very next line, behold, with the clouds of heaven there comes a son of man, and he comes to the ancient of days, is presented before him, and to him is given a, a, a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. You know, here is the hope. You and I might not be able to stand in that flamethrower, but the Son of Man can. Jesus called himself the Son of Man more than any other title because he wanted us to know that's me. And I stand in the throne room of heaven as one who has not got no sin, one who is holy and pure and undefiled, and he came into this world and suffered more than you or I ever will in our service for him, so that he might have all that we need to stand in judgment. You know, it's a fearful thing that God's destiny for this world, a world that we've just described tonight, is judgment. That's his destiny for it. That's what this passage teaches us. This will go on until judgment. And that's a fearful thing. But what a hopeful thing, that he has got a son of man in whom he has vested his kingdom. And son of man refers to the fact he became a human. It refers to the fact that he entered this world to do that work, to purify you of sin, pay for your sin, and in himself he has all the holiness you need to stand before God. You know, when I first started my job in Canberra, this is a major first world problems thing, but um, it'll make the point. I first started my job in Canberra, uh, and we were going on a speaking tour. We were taking a U.S. speaker on a speaking tour. And it was me and my boss and a few others were going along for the, for, the, for the travel. And I was traveling with the managing director at the time. I was chief of staff, 2IC. And we were traveling around. And of course, he had this like really top flight, frequent flyer status. So we got all the perks and all the rest of it. And so we go to the airport together. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, this is ridiculous. You're going to go like priority check-in, priority boarding, priority... You're going to go in the lounge. And I'm stuck like a pleb uh, out here. 
Ah, but I didn't understand something. I didn't understand that he was such a top status frequent flyer that he could take me with him. <laughs> and so I would walk up to the lounge with him and the lady at the lounge would say, could I see your boarding pass please, pass, please sir? And he'd show it to her and she'd say, please come in. And then she'd say to me, can I see your boarding pass please sir? Oh dear, I don't qualify. Ah, but then he would turn around and he'd say, it's okay, he's with me. And she'd say, oh, no problem. Do you know what? That's what Jesus does for you. It's okay. He's with me. She's with me. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world are judged. That's their destiny. But there's a final kingdom that will emerge forever and it's his kingdom and you can stand with him tonight what does it say that all peoples nations and languages should serve him there's the key choose this day whom you will serve that's what makes the difference and that's why these men could stand up against the world's tyrant despot Nebuchadnezzar and say we do not serve you we serve the one who has already conquered our hearts who already reigns there and he's greater than you are and we're about to prove it and that is the litmus test for all of us who do we serve let me close with an illustration I actually am closing um, <laughs> I say that sometimes and it's a, you know, well, I get other ideas. This is an actual closer. There is a man called Count von Zinzendorf, cracker of a name. Uh, he founded the Moravian Brethren, and was a mission, which is a major missionary movement across the world. Von Zinzendorf's testimony goes like this. He was a young man and he was sort of being inducted and educated into the aristocracy. He was a man of noble birth, as they said. And as part of that, he had to do a tour of Germany to uh, get into the cultural insights of, the, of Europe and so on. And he went to the Museum of Dusseldorf, I think it was. And while he was there, he saw a famous painting called Echo Homo, which means Behold the Man. I actually used to own this painting, and not the real one, obviously. Um, <laughs> not a, not a multi-millionaire, you'll be pleased to know. Um, anyway, he walked into that museum, and there it was, and it's a picture of Pilate presenting Jesus to the masses and it's Jesus from behind, and he's doing this, saying, behold the man, and the crowd is crying out for his crucifixion, they've got grimaced faces and all the rest of it. And it's said underneath that painting, this text, all this I have done for thee, what hast thou done for me? Isn't that powerful? And he was transfixed by the painting, he stood staring at it for an enormous amount of time, as it dawned on him, that he had done very little. That for the towering cost of his salvation, for the towering cost of one who has a kingdom who is willing to give it to him and bring him into it, he had served him so little. And when the museum closed, the attendants actually had to come and usher him away physically and take him outside. And he wrote in his diary, from henceforth, for me to live is Christ. Um, and I want to say to you, what have you done for him? What is your service to him? Because it's only that that will last. It's only that that won't be burned up in the final judgment. It's only that which will be welcomed by the King of Kings when his kingdom emerges supreme and overall. Like I said before, we need the values of Babylon's last day today, that we might see clearly what it is that is of eternal weight and eternal value. And Daniel's legacy in Babylon is not actually described in terms of earthly things. It's described in terms of his witness to the truth of God. It's described in terms of his, witness, his, his work, his participation in things that led to Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. We find later it's described in terms of the Magi that came from the east seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. The chief of the Magi in the East was Daniel, not that long prior, and a prophet. It's described in terms of the impact that he had on eternity. And Daniel 12.3, which is on one of the cards that you're given tonight, 
It's, he's one of those. It says that they that are wise shall shine like the firmament above, and those that turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. His kingdom is here. It will come in fullness. Will you receive it? How do you know? Do you serve him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you would give us perspective on the world that we live in. Lord, we are overwhelmed by beasts and blasphemers and cultural challenges and all the difficulties that come for our personal lives in light of that. But Lord, we give thanks that none of it can derail your kingdom. None of it can move the reign of the Ancient of Days off course. And Father, none of it can undo what the Son of Man has done for us, that we might serve Him as subjects in His kingdom, and that we might reign with Him forever and ever. Father, we pray that You would help us to have that perspective, that we might know about the judgment of this world, and that we might therefore, Father, do those things which would earn from Him the praise, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Thank you. Would you please be upstanding as we sing? We're going to sing the timeless classic, Amazing Grace. And you've been in such fine voice, I'm looking forward to singing this one a cappella with you and for you all to hear each other sing as we praise our glorious God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see.
amazing. Thank you. Please be seated. Babylon rises and falls. They have always worshipped idols. Because the first attack was on the authority of the Word of God. I am not ashamed. The cross of Jesus Christ is an absolute offense to the identity. You know, the Bible hasn't changed. The gospel hasn't changed. And the answer ultimately is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, nearly missed my cue. Um, look, I just want to make a comment before we start the Q&A, um, and that is that we do have a program for Australians. Uh, there are things we're doing for Australia, as you can imagine, with two Australians at the helm of answers in Genesis. Uh, and that program is called Catalyst. It's on the screen. There's a QR code there for more information. It is for 18 to 25-year-olds, and effectively, you pay your airfare, and a small fee, which is heavily subsidized by us, and we're fortunate to be able to do that, thanks to people's generous support. Um, and it is a 10-day worldview program like no other. Actually, it's a worldview experience like no other in the United States of America. It is on site at the Ark Encounter. Uh, you will participate in the Christmas time celebrations, which are there. Incredible acres and acres of Christmas lights, Christmas concert, nothing like it in Australia, as well as really world-class worldview teaching on the sorts of ideas and biblical truths that you will need to navigate your life in a secular world at that age. Uh, and we've got great people that do that teaching, uh, and also a whole bunch of just great experiences thrown in. So we do lots of excursions, we go and do lots of cool things. Uh, it's a little bit excessive, but we do it because we want people to never forget it. Um, and so, if you are 18 to 25, you qualify, especially if you're finishing school and you're 18, what a great way to uh, spend your December. Uh, it's just before Christmas. So, I want to commend that program to you. It's already very full. We're going to have to find ways to see how to expand it, but uh, uh, that's my little promo. Um, see you there. Uh, Ken and Martin, we're about to go into Q&A. This is going to be pretty tight. Uh, we've shortened the time, and we're going to keep it very snappy. That's because Ken the, went over time. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Ken... Actually, with the Ken, number of questions, we should lengthen the time. There's, well, there's Ken, millions of questions. Well, gonna, maybe not millions. I'm going to try this. <laughs> let's, see, let's see how Ken hands, handles this question. Ken, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, there were Nephilim giants. How did they then reappear? Nimrod, Og of Basham, Goliath... As a special, do you think they are still around? Martin, would you stand up for a moment, please? <laughs> Behold, they, the Nephilim. They, they can't tell. It's only when I come off the stage that people go, oh my goodness, you can't tell, because I'm, I'm all in proportion, see? So, you know, it's difficult to tell from a distance. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Or? Actually, I will add a bit that uh, in Genesis 6, it just says, and there were Nephilim, and there's a different word, but it says it means the same. Uh, you know, the sun in the, after the flood, the sons of Anak were, were Nephilim. They had to, the Israelites had to go and fight cities of giants. Remember, David uh, had to fight Goliath, and Goliath's brothers uh, were giants. I, I just personally believe that's just referring to... Uh, a group of people, certain people who were giants. And I know some people talk about, you know, sons of God and daughters of men and that produced the Mephilim. It does not say that. And um, just as a little aside, I don't believe that uh, angels and humans can, can procreate together. Uh, the Bible would speak against that. Um, but anyway, other than that, they were, they were giants. 
I was really worried that I had said something controversial in my talk. Oh, you did. Uh, and then, I, after you've answered that question, I can at least share the blame. <laughs> um, well, before we come to you, Mark, with a, a tricky one, here's another one, Ken. Surely the entire scientific theory of dating isn't wrong. The entire scientific <laughs> theory of dating is fallible. That's what we need to say. It is not infallible. And it is not absolute. Any, anything man does like that, look, dating, and of course, you know, the young people want to talk about a different sort of dating, but uh, <laughs> when you're talking about uh, dating in regard to the age of the earth and uh, rocks and so on, you're talking about the past. And there are things you don't know. And you weren't there to see it start. And, any dating method, it doesn't matter what the dating method is, it could be rubidium strontium, potassium argon, carbon dating, it doesn't matter what it is, they're all based on a series of assumptions and the basic overall assumptions is you have to know what was there to start with, you have to know what happened over time, uh, you have to know if something was, was leached out or not, uh, you have to know if the rates of change have always stayed the same. Every dating method is fallible, every single one. And there can be all sorts of unknowns uh, assumptions that you don't even realize and other unknowns. So, no, you can't trust man's fallible dating methods in an absolute sense at all. Uh, if um, Ken, why aren't there any human fossils at all found with dinosaur fossils? Because the dinosaurs ate them all. <laughs> okay. Um, this uh, one too. Okay, let, let, me, let me be serious. Uh, all right. <laughs> Come to think of it, I've never answered that question that way before. I, it's, I'm tired. I've got jet lag. <laughs> it must be all it is. Okay, so uh, I will make a point though. People often ask, why do we not find human fossils with, and dinosaurs and uh, with dinosaur fossils and so on? Most people don't realise that the fossil record. 95% of the fossil record are of um, marine snails, of the other 5%, uh, most of that are plants and insects. So if you were sort of thinking in terms of, you know, a graph uh, and the fossil record is that, that much of it, just move my hand down, just a tiny fraction, are uh, marine snails, corals, plants, and insects. In other words, vertebrate fossils are an incredible, it's less, it's a fraction of a percent of the fossil record of vertebrate fossils. So vertebrate fossils really are rare. We, we tend to think the fossil record is mainly dinosaurs or, you know, and, and fish and, and so on, and, and vertebrate animals, but it's not true. It's just a tiny fraction. I think, you know, when the floodwaters ran off the earth, it washed a lot of those surface layers off. Um, and we've hardly, even though we've sampled the fossil record, do you know how much of the fossil record there is on this earth that we have not dug up? We only sampled a tiny fraction of it. We don't really know uh, all that's there. And there's a lot of places where there's all sorts of deposits of mammal bones, we don't know what they are. Remember from, God only made two humans to start with, but he made all these animals and animal kinds. So you'd expect um, it, you'd be more rare to even try to find a human fossil. Plus, what was, why did God send the flood? To destroy. It, the word means to obliterate man. And he did. He sent that flood to obliterate man. And he obliterated uh, the, the pre-flood world. So you would not expect really to find human fossils in that sense out there. I'm making an exception here, Ken, because you're on a roll. Um, Here's one from Joe, who obviously works here in WA. Okay, we're going to work Martin here in a minute. He's sitting there Someone doing... Text me the questions that are going to be for me, so I can prepare while he's... <laughs> no, you've got to have them spontaneous like me. You're not going to... Um, that'd well, be, cheat. no, that'd no, be no, cheating. Yeah. Now, okay. Gentlemen, <laughs> I, I work in industry where oil and gas from kilometres below the... I work in an industry where oil and gas come from kilometres below the sea floor. The oil and gas is a result of decomposed organic matter. Do you believe this happened in 6,000 years? Oh, I believe it happened in a lot less time than that. 
I think most of that is, uh, comes from the flood, uh, from the deposits from the flood. Keep in mind that you can make uh, oil in a laboratory in minutes if you have the right conditions. In fact, uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a plant in Michigan, and I've actually been past it, where they take, you know, Americans love to eat turkeys. They eat dead turkeys everywhere. And uh, at Christmas, you know, devour all these turkeys. Anyway, there's a place, there's a plant that actually takes turkey innards, for instance, and uses that to produce oil. Uh, so you can do that quite easily. And then you can even, you can make coal fairly easy given the right conditions. In fact, there's uh, times when we've actually seen, you know, fence posts that have uh, coalified, just you, if you have the right conditions. And so, you know, in Bass Strait, you've got some uh, massive uh, deposits there that produce oil while we're sitting here, actually. Uh, that happens quite quickly. So I believe it all happened as a result of the flood. So it happened in the last, within the last four and a half thousand years, certainly. Okay. Um, here's a question for you, Martin. My 16-year-old grandson, whom I live with, has told me he's trans and will not answer to his original name. I love him too much to, to affirm him in this. How can I relate to him? Wow. Is there any, uh, like a, a harder question, maybe? <laughs> um, wow. Well, thank you for asking, Martin. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, there's one sense in which you know your son best, you know your circumstances best. I can give principles. Uh, the application of those principles needs care in individual circumstances um, and maybe some pastoral impl input as well. I mean, let me put, let me give you a general principle and that is, um, well, it comes from, I'll give you an account from the New Testament. Jesus met that young man, the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Okay, now you love your son, that's no doubt about that. Uh, and we are all commanded to act out of love towards others. But I want you to notice how Jesus loved him. Jesus said, go, sell all that you have. No, he says, keep all the commandments. And he says, I've done that since my youth. He says, okay, go, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Now, what Jesus was saying there is not that in order to become a Christian, you have to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You should give to the poor, but that's not a requirement on becoming a Christian. What Jesus was showing this young man in a masterstroke was that he was a sinner. Because he had said, I've kept all the commandments since my youth. And Jesus says, hang on, I'm about to prove to you that you haven't even kept the first one. You have another God before the true God. You have something you would never give up for the sake of following Christ. And the conclusion of that encounter is that it says, he went away sorrowful. Isn't that a weird, culturally weird thing to consider, that Jesus looked at him and loved him, and yet the encounter finished with him being sad? Because today we're told that love requires you to make the other person feel good. Love requires you to, you know, to be loving means to be inoffensive to people. Um, I remember being at a, a, a speech by somebody who was commenting on the Israel Folau issue, um, and uh, the thing that, um, that, that he said was, well, you know, Falau could have been more loving in what he said. And I approached the man afterwards, he was a Christian, and I said, what did you mean by loving in that context? And it was quite clear that he meant exactly that. Well, don't allow people to feel bad. You know, love is not defined by yours or my subjective feelings. Love is defined by a much higher standard. Um, love is defined according to the work of Christ, where He came at cost to Himself to do not what you and I wanted, but what you and I needed, right? None of us wants the cross because it's the towering cost of our sin. 
A lot of people in this culture right now are saying, oh, well, maybe belief in God would be a good thing for us. God doesn't come that way. God comes in a way you don't want. He comes via the cross, right? Nobody wants that. Um, And so what I would say is this, there must be a way, and again, carefully done, um, but there must be a way to be the person in someone's life who is prepared to love them in the way that Jesus loved by ensuring that they know the truth, by allowing them to see what they need to see, by causing them to hear what they need to hear. Um, That is a kind of love that people are so unwilling to exercise these days. Uh, And I'm sure you're close to your son and you can find ways to do that. That would be my general principle. And the reason it is love is because what's the alternative? Uh, You know, I actually had a very, very, very good friend in high school, um, and uh, he knew my beliefs, and he came out as gay, and we were friends, and I said, well, let's catch up. Um, And he said yes, but then he just never came. Uh, And the the relationship fell apart, and he went overseas. And I reflected on that, I felt bad about it, and I thought, you know what it was? He already knew what I was going to talk about. He already knew what I was going to say, and at least he knew. I wouldn't love him to death. At least he knew that I would love him enough to say, hey man, let's talk about it, and I wouldn't just be that voice of affirmation. There'd be more to my interaction with him. Uh, And we need to enable people to see truth, we need to preserve them from the lies that would lead them down dark paths, but we must do it for one cause, and that is the gospel, ultimately, lead them to Christ. So, uh, let us, may we all be that kind of person in the context God has given us. Uh, <clears throat> Martin, somebody's been listening to your message on Daniel and asked this question. Daniel allowed his name to be changed to a pagan name. Should he have resisted this? Well, I would say that, um, well, it's interesting. He, it's not that he allowed it. Um, you remember what the chief eunuch said. He said, well, Um, if we don't go along with the food plan, the king is going to have our heads. He's going to cut our heads off. Okay, so it was imposed on him by force. Uh, It wasn't something he allowed. It just happened. And they came along and called him um, Belteshazzar, uh, which, you know, Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means something about Bel. Is it Bel is great or... Uh, Bel is my judge or something like that. Bel is the Babylonian god, the chief of the gods. Uh, And so, yes, it was a pagan and a terrible name. Uh, But there's no record of Daniel ever adopting it. It, The book is called Daniel. The queen mother comes out at Belshazzar's feast on Babylon's last day. And what does she say? Get Belteshazzar? No. She says, get Daniel. So he clearly called himself Daniel. He clearly maintained the name that he was given, despite what the indoctrination process tried to do in those early days. Uh, And so, there's a lesson there in that he did what he could, Um, but sometimes there are things that are totally impossible that we have to bear. Uh, And so, both of those things come out in that example. A very popular question tonight uh, for you, Martin and Ken. Are there plans for a creation museum and Ark Encounter in Australia one day. (laughs) Well, if somebody here tonight wants to donate $200 million, uh, (laughs) we will certainly do something. And find 1,500 staff and uh, build it in a place in Australia where people will come and make it and, you know, and if anyone can supply it for <coughs> someone to overcome all the environmental issues in Can you imagine planet. the planning problems? Oh, can you imagine? Oh yeah. my goodness. Can you imagine trying to harvest timber in Australia? <laughs> you know, people chaining themselves to the trees. The um, answer to that question is, there's a better one already built. Just come see it. Um, save up, get it save done. Save up for an airfare. Or help the young people of Australia to see it by sending them to Catalyst. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question um, from Dave Hughes, and I 
We're in our last sort of eight minutes, so we're sort of popcorn questions now. Dave Hughes, people who were born in times and places that didn't get the chance to hear the gospel, how will they be judged? You know, I, I think, first of all, remember what Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And we've got to remember, we're not God. God knows everything. He knows every heart. We don't know those things. So don't act as if we're God and say, I don't, that's not right or that shouldn't happen. We don't know. We're just finite human beings. And we've got to learn the lesson of Job, who in Job 42 fell down dust and ashes and said, I now see you, you know all things. So shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We, we trust God. He's going to do what's right. And, but, but there's another, a couple of things. Number one is that Job, Romans 1 makes it clear. God said it's evident to all that he's created, that you're without excuse. So he's made that evident to all. Number two, um, in Romans 2, it says the law is written out of hearts. We all have a conscience. But also remember in Scripture, it says if you seek after God, if you seek after truth as you seek after silver and gold, he will reveal that to you. You will find it. He promises that. And I, I, I believe very much that if, if pe God knows people who want light, he, want, he knows those who want that light. And he will give them that light. Um, the Queen of Sheba is a good example. He, she's even mentioned in regard to the religious leaders who were rejecting Jesus. And, and, uh, and she's brought up uh, in regard to the fact that she sought light. And uh, so God uh, gave her that and brought her to that. So I, I often wonder, why does a missionary go to this group over here and not to this group? Or why does someone feel burdened to go here? I believe it's God controlling the whole situation, he's sovereign, and there are people there that need that light that he's taking to them, that message of the gospel. Seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. God answers that for people. And you say, well, and look, that's why missionaries have gone over the whole known world in decades and centuries previous. And if it's a burden you have, maybe you're a missionary. But then of course people say, well, what about Yemen? What about the place where you, you just can't? It's interesting, there are people converted in contexts like that and their testimony is, I saw a vision of Jesus. Uh, you know, he answers the prayer somehow, every time. Uh, I also heard another testimony of, a, of someone from that part of the world uh, who found Christian preaching and Christian radio uh, on a bandwidth that was coming in from another country. Uh, and that led to conversion. So the judge of the, all the earth does right. Uh, and with God, all things are possible. What, um, you be there. Um, what do you predict will be Christians' biggest challenge defending the faith in Australia over the next 20 years? <laughs> you know, I, I hate questions. Did you have something to say, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was going to answer, but then you stirred. <laughs> I mean, I'll go. I'll say something. But you, I'll you go, go, then you go. How's that? I'll you go, go, I'll go first. first. I'll, it's good when you have time to think of your answer. Um, oh, I'll, I'll no, say no, it's all good. No, 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 I'll prove that I can do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the most, I always find those questions hard. Uh, I hate it when people say the most, because it's hard. Then it puts the pressure on. So let me tell you a really important one a really high order one. And it is the one which I have talked about a fair bit on this tour, which is that Babylon is a seductress. Babylon makes, she offers us, she offers luxuries and bread and circuses and opportunity and progress and just the joys of life to the common person if they play their cards right. Okay? And there's nothing wrong in those things of themselves. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. There's nothing wrong with, if God has blessed you with money, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the catastrophic threat. It is that being materially prosperous, which all of us actually are in historical terms, right? Being material, materially prosperous deceives the heart of, 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 of a person into believing that they are spiritually prosperous. Uh, Jesus said to the wealthy church at Laodicea, you say I'm rich, I, I, I have prospered, I lack nothing. Not realizing that you are poor, blind, miserable and naked, 
What a deception. And here are people going on with life, getting you know, tied up with all the things that commit us, getting ahead in their uh, careers and building families and all that. And God says, you know what? Your life is kind of so good, you've so forgotten about me that you're bankrupt and you are neither hot nor cold. Um, and I think that in Australia, we just want everything to be um, easy-go-lucky. We want everything to be fine. Uh, we want peace. We are apathetic. You know, Americans are not apathetic, but they're always hustling. They want progress, success, wealth. I think with us, we just kind of just want to have an easy time. Uh, and here's the problem. If you just want to have an easy time, in a culture that's going the way this one's going, but you also want to serve Christ, the King of Kings, you can't have both. There's going to be a day when Babylon comes along and says, hey, that easy time you're having, you know, it's wear it purple day tomorrow. Wear it, I should do it that way. Wear it purple day tomorrow. Wear purple. You wouldn't want to muck up your career, would you? Hey, Christian school, um, you know, you've prospered for such a long time, you've had lots of students, you've got government money, um, you wouldn't want to be in the headlines tomorrow, would you? You know, you wouldn't want a lawsuit on your hands, would you? Okay, change your gender policies, tell them that you love them and you won't have to worry, right? Compromise your beliefs. And you know what we do? We fall for it every time. Every time, because we just want things to be easy. That's our greatest spiritual threat. And my concern is that Jesus says, you are poor, blind, miserable and naked. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, I, I'll just add to that by saying, you know, I think for, for anyone, it doesn't matter what country you're in, but if you take Australia and America, I think a lot of people look at the world and say, what do we do? Look how bad the world's getting. I think we should be looking at the church and saying, what's wrong with the church? Uh, I think that's the big issue because there's, and it involves, you know, the church weakening in regard to being soft, or Christian schools being soft on LGBT and other sorts of things, not prepared to take their stand, not having the courage to take their stand, compromising God's word in Genesis. I think we need to be looking at the church and saying, you know, we need to do something about the church or we're going to continue not to have an impact as we should. Uh, I think we're, we might be at our last question. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut the applause off, sorry. Um, uh, because I did cut the applause off, Ken, I'll ask you this question. Um, how long did Adam and Eve live in perfection before sin and the introduction of death? And does Adam's genealogical age start from the fall? Um, well, number one, Adam's genealogical age starts from day six when he was made. He, he lived through day six, he lived through day seven, he died when he was 930 years old. God gives us uh, the fact that he... In the beginning is time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Space-time continuum began right then uh, on the first day. And so time begins then. So that's chronology right there. Uh, but how long were Adam and Eve in the, in the garden before sin? Okay, so I don't think they were there very long at all um, because they were told to be fruitful and multiply. And they would not therefore have conceived uh, a child uh, before sin because all are sinners. So I think, yeah, and, and we know that, um, uh, that conception can happen uh, each month. Uh, so I don't think it was that long. In fact, it's very interesting. Now, I, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, I'm just suggesting an idea. If you read Art, Archbishop Usher's uh, Chronology of the World, which is absolutely incredible history book, and, and we published that, it was retranslated from the Latin, The Annals of World History, it's called. And he was a great man, but he made something, he said something very interesting. He said that, um, uh, you know, why does it in Leviticus say the, the atonement is on the 10th day? Because perhaps Adam and Eve fell you know, on, on the ninth day and the first atonement was on the tenth day when God killed animals and, uh, and sacrificed them. So maybe they fell very quickly, extremely quickly. Didn't take long at all. Anyway, it's just a suggestion. I think it's a pretty good one. 
Ladies and gentlemen, would you put your hands together for Martin and Ken. Just very quickly, don't forget to get your Bible as you leave and uh, read Genesis tonight before you go to bed. Because we're going to be up for ages, you need to be up for ages too. I'm going to, I'm going to take 20 seconds of your time before we wrap this up. Uh, and that is just to say, people ask about things in Australia from Answers in Genesis in the Q&A. I just want to say yes, we are doing things for and in Australia. What you need to do is when that QR code comes up on the screen, you just need to scan it uh, because uh, the ministry we want to have here is one marked by understanding the times and knowing what to do, uh, like the men of Issachar in the Old Testament. So we want clarity and we want action. I don't want to just sit around and talk about it. Uh, and the first thing that we want to do is catalyst, as you've heard. Second thing, Answers Army. And the Answers Army is all about ordinary people doing simple things to promote the gospel everywhere. And the first thing we'd like to do is get scripture into every home in Australia. Uh, it's about eight and a half million homes. With your support and your activism, we can get that done. Doing this doesn't obligate you to be part of that. It just gets you signed up. It gets you involved. It gets you understanding what's happening. And you can choose then to take the opportunities that come your way. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and I haven't had to say this for a few years, by God's grace, and maybe I won't have to say it again for a long time, but just at the moment, uh, we do need money uh, because we'd like to start here in Australia, but it needs to be Australian funded to do all of this activity. So we were able to subsidise these events because of generous early support, um, but for us to keep going, we're going to need more support uh, in the future. So that's my pitch. Thank you all for coming. What a blessing you've been. Uh, God bless. Good night. <laughs> We have one final song we would love to sing with you tonight and you've sung so well it would be shame to leave. Beautiful song, Facing a Task Unfinished.
Uh, thank you and good night. I would love you to stay and sing all night. The way you've sung has been amazing. Thank you so much, Perth. Um, on your way out, you might try and check in about some of those wonderful resources you've heard about uh, and make, take the opportunity uh, to get those. But I do wish you safe travels and God bless. Good night. Thank you. Welcome to Building Blocks. If this is more dense, it should flow down and extinguish all of these candles. She depends on the warm sunshine to warm her up or the cool shade to cool her down. If I were still teaching worldview classes in high school, I would show this movie. You can't Christianize a worldview that has a wrong foundation. Welcome to our program. It's called Out and About, and I'm your host, Buddy Davis. I'm Peter Schremer, and this is I Can See. It's really important for every Christian to understand this issue. This is gonna be so fun. I can't wait. It sounds like a blast. How about you? Getting excited yet? Of course. You know me. I'm up for literally anything, even if it might be a little boring. What? Boring? Gracie, tell her. Yeah, were you not listening? There's so much to do. Zip lines, ice cream, virtual reality, a zoo, and just wait till you go inside. <laughs> I guess you'll just have to see it for yourself. Well, Liz, here we are. The big moment of truth. <gasps> wow. Increíble. <laughs> Buenazo. Pretty uh, amazing, isn't it? Let's do this. <laughs> Try and keep up, girls. Told you, Izzy. Sometimes you just gotta think bigger. <sighs> it sure is good to be back. <laughs>